evening, everybody. I'm going to call. My name is Florida Smith. I'm the school board chair. I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.15 or 6.16 Eastern time. Uh, we are all here today for a common cause, which is supporting public education for uh, kids across our five communities and to stay student center and, uh, and make data informed decisions uh, all together today. Let's acknowledge as a board that Recording the complexity in progress. of where we are and how we got here today. I know it's not easy, but um, but let's be hopeful. Uh, we are going to carry on forward and be as judicious as we can to set our school district uh, for the, uh, in a sustainable path for the future. There is a lot of work to be done and difficult decisions to be made, uh, and we know it won't be easy. Uh, but hopefully our shared commitment to our students, our communities, and our public education transcends all the differences and provides a, a common ground for us to stay centered in the opportunities that we have together as a district and the larger sense of community that we need to model for all of the attendees here today and for all of our communities. So I am actually, weirdly enough, really fired up and excited for the conversations that we're going to have tonight from strategic planning to configuration and to the budget. So. Let's get started. Uh, so the next thing is to uh, the adjustments to the agenda. We are going to uh, cross out or table uh, number three because we are not at Calis today. What we're going to do is do that when we are in Calis on the 10th. So we're moving the 10th to an in-person meeting at Calis because we have to move today to remote. So if the board is OK with that, uh, could I have a motion to accept the agenda as amended? Thank you, Ursula, uh, and a second, Michelle. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, we have an agenda accepted by everybody. And now we're gonna move into, I see that we have a lot of people in our meeting today. So I'm gonna move into public comments. And I just wanted to check in a little bit about public comments today. Public comment, not today, but as we haven't had this conversation in a while, but public comment is an opportunity for the public to make comments directly to the board. Uh, the public should not expect a response to their comments. The board role during public comment is to listen. The board takes the public comments into consideration as it does its work. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna read a couple of guidelines for public comments that we have uh, done in the past, but since we haven't done it in a long time, let's just uh, do this today. Uh, please identify yourself uh, and which town you're from. Uh, comments should be kept to two minutes. Mark is gonna have a little timer. I promise we're gonna see you and the timer is gonna be really little in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Uh, comments should be directed to the board. The board chair will respond to public comments as appropriate, but and the board will determine whether comments made during public comment should become part of a future agenda. Okay, so with that, uh, any public comments that are not related to either the strategic plan or the configuration study or the budget. Because if you see the agenda, we have allowed time for public comment after those presentations. So if there's another subject that somebody is here that would like to have a public comment right now, please raise your hand. Okay, I see one hand, is that correct? Okay, Hannah, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And Mark, you're... Hi there. Um, oh, I'll turn on my video. Um, sorry, I just installed my app today, so I had to open all my settings. Um, thanks. I just have, I just have one comment um, that has to do with procedure and not content. Um, and that's that um, I know the facilitation of these board meetings are super contentious. And it's really difficult, um, but I, I've noticed, um, and this is a note for um, for you, Floor, for the chair, I've noticed um, um, interruptions, um, specifically of the board members from my town that I elected. Um, oh, I'm from Middlesex. My name is Hannah Brown. I'm from Middlesex. So um, I know that everybody has super strong feelings, and I personally would be a terrible facilitator because um, I'm you know, fiery and impulsive. Um, so I, I, I understand if you have really strong feelings or disagree or want to correct something, but part of the norms of the board is letting everybody talk. Um, and I really would appreciate it. Um, if, 
if that were um, held to. Um, and I mean, I truly feel that when a board member is talked over or doesn't get to finish their thought or is argued against, that that's, that's actually a disenfranchisement um, of the voters of the town um, that they represent. So uh, that's my comment. I would really appreciate it if those norms could be held to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Hey, Jill, Jill, do you want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me okay? I Yes, we can hear you okay. Trying to think of, it's Mark. been so long since we've done the Zoom thing. <laughs> Um, thank you for some time tonight to speak. Um, I've shared an email with the board um, with my concerns about the uh, proposed library cuts in our district. And um, I don't want to read through the whole letter in the essence of time and people who might want to have the chance to speak tonight. Um, but I did want to clarify another potential concern on top of the letter that I sent. Um, and that is in regards to the potential plan from my understanding is to take away time from all of our libraries in order to provide library services at one school. Um, and my concern in that is that it's really challenging to understand a library collection, to understand um, library programming, to understand how to collaborate with the teachers in a school. And I think it'd be really a huge challenge for anybody stepping into that position, whether it's one person or a combination of people in order to fill that role. It's not like um, putting on a Band-Aid or changing the trash. Librarianship is no longer about taking care of books. It's about building an inclusive collection, working with your students and staff and helping people love libraries. And it's just, I don't think it's possible to be done by a multitude of people. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, regarding the letter that I sent, um, but I think I'll leave it at that. And I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Jill. Uh, just a quick reminder, because some people join after, unless you can't be part of the entire meeting, uh, that we are going to have time to speak about the budget. Uh, the budget, there's a section for public comment right after the presentation of the budget, and we'll have time for public comment right after a configuration study. A presentation too and our strategic plan. So, thank uh, so Becca, thank you, Jill. I responded to your text, Becca. So do you still have a comment or can you wait until we're um, in bed? That's a great question. I don't know that I'm going to be able to, it's dinner time and all that. So I don't know. Um, so uh, can I make my comment now? Is that okay? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to try to be really succinct. Um, I just want to, there's sort of an overarching thing um, for me is that the way that the that folks frame this conversation is really important um, in helping the community understand sort of where we're starting from. And I think it would be really helpful if we started from a place of understanding that it is a lot more expensive to educate kids today than it was when some of us were growing up, right? So part of the reason our budget is going up is because it's more expensive to educate kids to be part of a 21st century world. And I think if we started from that framework, it might help this conversation feel a little bit more generative and a little bit more productive and less about sort of cutting and slashing. Um, so the other piece is that I think that having these conversations without knowing how many people in the district are paying based on income and how many of them are based on property taxes makes it so we don't actually really know how these budget changes impact people. And I really appreciate that we're gonna do that once we have a final budget, but I think it would be helpful to do it for all three potential budgets so that we could actually really get a sense of what we were, how people's um, sort of tax bills are gonna be impacted. Um, and then I just wanna say that I don't wanna see the world language program cut at Romney um, last year taxpayers made it very clear that we didn't want to cut. And so I was really surprised to see it on the chopping block again. And, you know, similarly, the cuts to library and allied arts, we, we made it pretty clear last year, we didn't want to see those kind of cuts. And I think that they are penny wise and pound foolish. Um, because, you know, again, we're um, educating kids for a 21st century world, right? And it's like the previous speaker just said, it's not just about books, right? It's about coding and intellectual like and tech and understanding critical thinking skills really important and art we just we know how important art is for helping kids to be better more focused learners and it's 
really key. So again, Pennywise and Pound Foolish. Um, a couple, I know I'm almost out of time. I have a couple of questions you're, about you're some headline it. items. Um, uh, the instructional related technology services part of the budget. I'm curious about the professional services and the increase of $150,000 there. Curious what that is and what the communication services In the superintendent line item, um, 150 additional, 150,000, 150 additional, God, that's a hard word to say, but you know what I mean, $150,000 additional there. Curious about that and where that's coming from, especially when we're making some really significant cuts in other part of the budget. So um, thank, thank you, you. Becca. Honey. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. Hi, this is Honey Dean Barrett, and I am currently a teacher at Doty and a resident in Middlesex with two children at East 32. And I'll share more later about thoughts on the budget, but I just want to um, share this kind of clarifying question that I had. The board speaks often about equity in schools, and I believe what you are leaning towards is having equal programming and equal staffing in schools. Equity in schools is quite different from equality. Do you want schools to be equitable and have what they need, or do you want them to have equal programming? I just want clarification on that. Um, further, the current inequities and inequalities between the elementary schools versus the middle and high school are pretty massive. So I'm just asking you to be clear in your wording and your planning. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Okay, I don't see any other. Am I missing anybody? Hey, Erica Rose, go ahead. And then we're gonna move on. You're muted, Erica. Thank you. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Erica Rose, the art teacher from Callis Elementary and Berlin Elementary. It has been suggested that our district cut 0.8 FTE from our art program and art educators teach up to six classes a day. This is unreasonable, especially considering that we teach across five buildings. If you spent any time with an elementary art teacher, then I'm sure you know that it takes an incredible amount of time to prep for a quality art program that exposes students to a rich and wide variety of media. It takes time to set up and maintain multiple classrooms, and it takes time to transport materials and student projects between schools. If I had an hour, I could explain what goes into prepping for clay. Art is a different beast and should not be compared to other subject areas when you look at the amount of instructional time we spend with students. If our FTE is reduced to what's being proposed and we're asked to teach more than four classes a day in multiple buildings, then the quality of our art program will be jeopardized. There will not be time in the schedule for clay or many of the materials that my students are currently exposed to. For many art classes, the only place where students get to create and use their imagination beyond markers and crayons. There won't be time to display work throughout the school or organize art shows. It's painful to think about my students missing these opportunities. We'd be robbing them of a significant part of their education. This level of reduction is unsustainable and inequitable. As a district, we will not benefit from such a drastic change to our art program, but more importantly, our students will suffer. Please seriously reconsider this devastating cut to our art program. Our students deserve more. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Catherine Dodge. Hey, my name is Catherine Dodge, and I'm a student from Cross Elementary School. It's my understanding that the Callis Elementary School nurse and counselor may be reduced to half time. I don't think that this proposable proposal is in the best interest of the Callis students. Students rely on our nurse daily for various reasons. Many students also rely on the support of our counselor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Okay, with that, uh, let's get started with our strategic planning and configuration, Megan. Sure, I'm gonna share my screen. Give me just a second. Hi everyone. Okay, I think everyone can see. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna frame our conversation a little bit and then I'm gonna introduce 
um, our colleague and facilitator through our strategic planning process to do part of this. Um, just kind of open it by saying, um, we know this is a big conversation. There are multiple big conversations happening tonight. Um, and the steering committee knew that when they planned tonight's agenda. Um, they know that hearing about the strategic plan and where the district is headed is a big conversation by itself. Hearing about the work of the board related to configuration is a big conversation by itself. And certainly the budget conversation is big. And they decided to put them all together because they're connected. What we want for our kids, how we should be structured and how much it costs to educate them are all connected. So just sort of acknowledging there's a lot of information that's gonna be shared. Um, in a second, um, I'll share more detailed information, but um, the there's two things that we're going to share with you in this portion of the meeting. One is an overview of the strategic planning process, and this is the board's opportunity to um, learn and about the final version of the strategic plan. Um, board, as you know, you've been updated throughout the process, and you will um, approve this plan should you decide, decide to approve the plan um, at your last April meeting, the April 17th meeting. Um, the second part of today is a conversation to bring to the full board the presentation that the Finance Committee, which has been charged with studying configuration, um, bring that presentation to the full board. So that's what we're about to do tonight. Um, I am gonna facilitate the slides. There is an input opportunity built into this presentation specific to configuration. It's not yet the budget portion. We'll explain what it looks like at the end, um, but I just wanted to let folks know. Um, so we can't really see you. We won't stop for questions during the presentation and there's an input opportunity um, at the end. So this is what we're going to do today. Um, and the first part, uh, which is really about our core values and our strategic plan, I'm gonna turn this over to Jeannie Phillips um, in a second when I frame kind of why we started here. Um, but Jeannie is our consultant from the Great Schools Partnership who's been working with us for um, a little over a year now uh, on this plan. So again, we knew when we started a conversation last year um, and actually continued a conversation that this district has had in the past that the most important way to ground a discussion about how we should be configured is in a discussion about what we believe we want for students. And so that is a strategic planning process. So Jeannie, I will advance slides. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanna first acknowledge the committee of folks who've worked really hard on this strategic plan. We had parents and community members as student administrators, uh, educators from different buildings. And so we had a big um, group of folks who've worked really hard in many capacities to um, uh, solicit community feedback and then to synth synthesize that into um, core beliefs, goals and action steps. So you can see those folks there. If we move to the next slide, I'll just remind you, um, I think last spring we looked at this exact graphic and talked a little bit about the very various phases of the work, starting with engaging that, that uh, committee and talking about how we were gonna engage the community um, so that we could draft a shared uh, vision and core beliefs, then moving to goal setting um, engaging the community again, and then from those goals, articulating action steps. So here we are in phase four of sharing the strategic plan. So uh, the next slide, um, just as a reminder of uh, the questions we asked at the beginning of this process, which were focused on what are the hopes and dreams our community has for our young people? What are the core values that should guide our work? What skills and qualities they, do they need and how will they know that um, the district cares for and about them? And those questions just yielded so much rich data. We engaged the community. Uh, we went to each of the schools and engaged teachers in those conversations. We had a big community conversation at U32. And then we also um, put out a survey with these questions and used that data to formulate um, the core uh, beliefs for the district. Uh, what we found 
uh, in our work was that uh, well-being was super important to your community, that transparent and responsible leadership rose to the top as something that really mattered. Um, community engagement and relationships, rigorous curriculum and instruction, and humanity, justice, and community and belonging. All of those things were really important across the community. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time synthesizing uh, uh, um, all of that data into this document. And then again, sending it out for feedback. I think this might be the sixth iteration of this document. Actually, we revised and revised and revised. Um, that led us to the next phase, well, really into phases two and three, where we um, had focus groups uh, with students, uh, with community members, with educators, and, and also solicited feedback by a thought exchange to figure out, okay, what about these core, core beliefs? What um, is exciting or important? What's missing? And then if we do these, what does that look like? What are we already doing towards these? What more do we need to do? And that yielded even more data. That data really led us into a, a deep synthesis process where we were able to figure out that there were three main goals with some action steps underneath. And so the first goal is really focused on, um, could we go to the next slide, Megan? Thank you. Uh, building and nurturing a culture of well being and inclusivity. And so I think Megan is going to share. Um, the action steps document, if people want to read all of the action steps, is that correct, Megan? In the chat. So these paste, are going to be, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm going to paste several things. I actually should have said that before I let you jump in. I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to post the um, slides so that folks can follow around with the entire presentation. And then there's two documents that are the core beliefs and the goals by themselves. Um, so I will do that. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, so this first goal includes action steps around social emotional learning, around how we build community in our schools and beyond our schools, how um, we focus on inclusion, and how we can even um, think about assessing student well-being so that we can improve it. Um, as, as we formulated these goals, we also thought about how are we going to measure progress on these. And so on our next slide, we have some measures of progress. I'm asking Megan to like do multiple things at one time. <laughs> um, so there are some existing indicators, things al that already exist in the system that will help us measure these things, the equity indicators um, that watch this. Go ahead. Sorry. I can't actually paste things without stopping the presentation for a second. So I'm going to let you keep going. I'm going to I'm going to forward it to someone else who's going to post. So for those on the screen, it is coming. It's just not there yet. Thank you so much. Um, so the um, equity indicators the district has uh, developed, the communication and engagement plan, those are existing things we can use to measure our progress towards these goal, these action steps and this goal. And then there's also the creation of a new indicator, which is a professional learning plan that helps us keep track of the learning that we are articulated for this goal in the action steps. Uh, the second goal is really um, focused on, um, on what we're teaching in the classrooms. Uh, it's um, about making curriculum and instruction more responsive to students, providing more real world authentic opportunities in school and beyond school, and uh, further growing instructional practices in our classrooms. When we measure um, the progress on this, we're going to be looking at uh, some existing structures like the common assessment system, the education quality monitoring plan. And then we're also talking about um, instituting uh, new indicators, a youth advisory council, um, a prof the professional learning plan I mentioned for goal one will also help measure here and other regular feedback mechanisms to make sure we're making progress uh, as we move forward on this goal. Finally, the third goal is all about um, leadership, um, the governance structures um, that uh, and about engaging the community um, and communicating with community transparently 
Um, this, the goal, the action steps in this goal are really focused on strengthening family, student, and community connections and building the systems, um, including accountability systems that help us monitor our progress in the strategic plan. I just want to send a um, big, uh, oh, I forgot about the indicator, sorry. The indicators here, there are already a lot of existing indicators related to governance, and so those will really help us monitor our progress on this, including um, ed quality standards, um, the communication and engagement plan, the configuration study we're going to lead into. Those are all ways we can measure our progress in this area. And I just want to give another big um, uh, shout out and appreciation to all the committee members who served to make this work possible. It was such a, a joy working with them, even when the work was hard. Uh, they had such a can-do attitude and um, worked so hard to really uh, listen well to your community and to synthesize that into these core beliefs and goals and action steps. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. I'm actually going to take a second to put those links in right now. So forgive me, I'm going to pause the sharing. And that's mostly because we're about to share a series of slides that has a lot in it. Um, so let me do this. So this is the configuration slides. And folks on the screen, you don't have to follow along. This is just in case you want to. And these will all be posted on the website afterwards. Um, and if you want a standalone copy of the core beliefs, is this. I'm going to check this link to make sure. Yep, that is what I thought it was. And then a standalone and alone copy of the action steps, which are all in the slides. So if you would rather just look at it in one place, you can do that. And I would just reiterate, thanks to Jeannie. Um, one of the things that I would say is that this process has been about as iterative as you could possibly be. And for a facilitator, that's really challenging. Um, it's really important because that's how we needed the process to be, but um, I appreciate it. Genius ability to roll with how we how we did the work. Okay, so now I'm resharing. Okay, so the last piece, just to close out the strategic plan part, um, what we found uh, these three pillars. You've probably heard us talk about these before if you've been in any sort of board related meeting. But this is how we define the work within the system. That's how we take the the vision piece and bring it down a grain size. And we already had these three pillars and there's an incredible amount of alignment with our action steps coming out of this process and these, um, which is really exciting because that means that we are really working on the things our community wants us to do. So these these will continue to be um, iterated, iterated to include um, the action steps coming out of the strategic plan. Okay. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, and for the next part of the presentation, I'm also going to have the support of two of our administrators. Um, as you know, the Finance Committee is the group of the board that was charged with um, the sort of shepherding the configuration study. So doing the deep work and bringing it back to the full board. And we asked two administrators, um, an elementary and a uh, high school principal, so Alicia Lyford from East Montpelier and Stephen Dellinger Pate uh, from the high school to help with this. So they have been part of the finance committee and they'll help with this presentation. And I'm going to start with an overview of how we got where we are. Um, and I would also just remind us this is not the first time this, this district has had this conversation. You've discussed this from as far back as 2014. Um, but starting last year, the board made a really concrete decision um, to say, before we think about how our district should be configured, we need to know what it is we want for our students and where we're headed. Um, because that's really um, any configuration we uh, create um, needs to get us to this. And so last year, by design, the board started with strategic planning. That is when we 
um, put a request for proposals out, um, contracted with great schools, and uh, started the work that Jeannie just shared. So everything that we're doing in this part of the um, study is grounded in that work. Um, last August, the board saw a presentation about different ways to approach configuration. Um, the links that are in this, these slides are also on our website, so you can get them in different ways. Um, but the board learned about various ways other districts in Vermont have studied the issue of configuration. And in September, the board charged the Finance Committee to lead the study and make recommendations to the full board. Um, that's a structure they use. They chose to use the Finance Committee and they um, changed the representation of the Finance Committee to make sure that there is someone, a board member from every town. In October, the Finance Committee saw um, a number of pieces of data, um, again linked in here. In November, the committee did some brainstorming about different configuration options and decided that the full board should engage in that presentation in that brainstorming. So they did that in December. In February, the Finance Committee reviewed configuration simulations. This is mostly what you're going to see today. The committee did ask a few extra questions that we've updated in these presentations, but that's what you're going to see tonight, which brings us to April. That's where we are right now. Um, and the board's original target for action is June, and action is whatever the board decides it to be. But the board did put a placeholder um, in June to be able to uh, move move forward. And move forward could mean a decision. It could mean further study. It could mean whatever the board decides um, it should be. So again, another way to just represent how the board approached the work is this is grounded in what we believe for our students. Um, we need to think about how to organize ourselves to get there and study that deeply, and we need to engage the community. The committee and board, again, engaged in a number of activities to determine their priorities for configuration. Um, this process really focused on making sure all of our students can access high quality and enriching and instruction. And um, they discussed a number of things and landed on this set of priorities. And these became the priorities that we looked at different simulations um, alongside. So the board wanted to prioritize a configuration that lets our class sizes meet education quality standards and are sufficient to provide rich instruction, meaning big enough to be able to give strong instructional opportunities to students. Our board wants schools that are big enough to maintain full-time nursing and counseling positions. Our board wants to maintain or expand enrichment opportunities that are consistent across the system. Some of our schools are not big enough to provide some of these opportunities. Um, the board wanted to limit or eliminate shared positions across schools. Um, it's really challenging to have small FTE or to be covering multiple schools you will hear us talk about that in this budget presentation. And so as the board is exploring configurations, they want to limit that for our staff. The board also identified a pretty high priority and a lot of um, uh, everyone, a lot of commonality in looking at a configuration that moved middle school together to be grades six through eight and really create a middle level program for those grade levels. Um, that was a pretty universal recommendation. And the board wanted administrators to model, sim simulate what it would look like to have fewer than five elementary schools. I also put this slide in here. It's one that the board will see again in the budget presentation. Um, after the budget failed, uh, we did put out a um, post-budget survey and um, it asked in general for some information about uh, why people voted the way they did and what information they'd like the board to know. Um, and the way thought exchange works is it monitors things in two ways. Um, the two highest number of comments, so about 22% of the comments were in support of configuration and reconfiguration. A lot of those comments sort of had the tenor of, I know this is really hard, and I think it's time for us to look at that. And the second most common set of comments were the costs of our education right now are really difficult for our communities. 
And those two, so in addition to just counting separate comments, Thought Exchange asks people to rate comments. And the two comments, the two themes that receive the most rating were around consolidation support and costs. And I put that in here because as the board does its work and thinks about how to engage in community, um, this is a metric that talks about the um, level of support for these conversations. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. I know this is a lot. Um, configuration simulation. So this is really the piece where we show you what the finance committee um, saw a little bit earlier. And just a couple of things to get us started. When the board asked administrators to simulate these models, they wanted us to look at these models without looking at schools. And this was an important part of the exercise because instead of just taking our current reality and moving it around, it allowed us to say, what would we build and how would we build it if we could start from scratch? Um, and it really opened up the conversation for leadership. Uh, what would we design if we could really start over with, with what would be best for students? Um, the other thing that's really important to know, and you'll hear us say this a few different times, um, our articles of agreement require the vote of towns before things can close. So a question that we hear often is, um, can we just do this faster? And the answer is no, this has to be a thoughtful process based on your articles of agreement. Also want to show um, this, this slide has been in multiple presentations, both budget presentations and otherwise, but um, this shows our enrollment. We know that we have declining enrollment and will continue to decline actually quite a bit past FY26. But we show this because the simulations we're modeling for you used FY26 enrollment. And that's because we can't make this change next year. Um, at least these significant changes. Um, so FY26 felt like the right numbers to model. This is a very busy slide. So if you are looking at it on your screen or you look later, you'll be able to dive into this, but this is just our enrollment by grade level. And I think that's relevant because it shows you the changes starting at the younger grades and when they start to move up. And then there's a similar chart here for um, seven through 12 enrollment. So I won't spend a lot of time on those slides because I think that you can um, peruse them on your own. And I'm going to start with one more slide and then I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. The other thing that administrators looked at for the board was what is the student capacity in our buildings? Um, and this is done based on an agency of education analysis of square footage. Um, there's a per student amount. Um, this actually uses the most conservative calculation. Um, but at Berlin, we have about a 336 student capacity, 252 in Calais, 189 in Doty, 413 in East Montpelier, 268 in Rumney, and 1319 at U32. Um, and that's important for the board to know as they think about um, what capacity do we have in our physical spaces. And then that last line is how many students are currently in our schools. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, who is going to talk about um, uh, six through eight configuration. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having us uh, here for this presentation. Um, what you see in this slide is just, um, as we heard earlier, moving the sixth grade to U32 was pretty much on everybody's um, brainstorm list as a, as a strong possibility. And so we just wanted to make sure that we showed what would that look like. Um, the opportunities are to be able to expand to a full middle school program, not just a seven, eight program, um, which will uh, provide some additional opportunities for our sixth graders and will allow us to uh, expand and diversify some of our offerings to our middle school as a whole. There's some advantages to having more middle schoolers and how you do your program. Um, it also allows us to expand our after school programs. And um, it really responds to some of the enrollment declines as you'll see um, how we kind of configure in the next slide. And so what you see in this slide is that in the fiscal year 26, 
um, the middle school would be comprised of 261 students and the high school 912 would be 481. And that would take us from where we are right now with about 708 students and bringing in the entire sixth grade, our enrollment would only be 742 because of the declines in enrollment overall. And I really want to point out the 12th grade in physical year 26, there's 145 students. When that group graduates, the incoming class the following year, so that'd be physical year 27, will be somewhere around 90 students. So we will have uh, almost 50 student drop in our overall enrollment in just that year. So we will be down closer to our enrollment where it is right now when we reach physical year 27. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to accommodate the students, you can see that that's not going to be a problem. And also, it allows us to stabilize some of our workforce as well, because right now we have three cores of teachers, and those three cores of teachers can continue to teach both sixth, seventh, and eighth grade when we have those kinds of numbers, when we drop below 100, essentially. And we do not see any future year in which we uh, break 100 once we get to, uh, to these fiscal years. Uh, for our uh, class sizes. And so in the next slide, this is a this is a slide you'll see uh, a couple of different times in the way that we broke this down was we answered some of our questions, which is what are our optimal class sizes? Are we are for instruction? Are we meeting those? The answer for the six, eight middle school and the set nine, 12 high school is that we have optimal class sizes. It really does limit um, or eliminates partial FTEs, and this is part-time teachers, which um, we know are difficult to find and, and difficult to, to place in, um, in schools, so we can reduce that need. Uh, we can have expanded offerings, and the, the potential cost savings just for this piece alone is that we would um, not need um, five teachers across the district for uh, the grade six level classes, um, because we would be able to consolidate uh, those teachers um, with the middle school cores as they are. And so we could actually reduce the total number of teachers we need for sixth through eighth grade. Um, as you see, you'll see some of these same things for implications for further study. Uh, some of the special education questions, um, how do we distribute our, um, our needed teachers? What recommendations we'd make around that? Essential arts services would be uh, changed. And then there's just some basic licensure logistics that we have at U32 because most of our teachers are 712 licensed. Um, and so if the sixth grade is there, we'll need to expand to make sure that our teachers have middle grade um, uh, certification, which would be important for us um, to have another year. This is one of the other reasons why it's important that we plan a year out for this so our teachers can gain that. It's not a difficult process, but it's something we just need to go through. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so for the next section, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia Leifer. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to share with you two different models that we looked at for elementary schools. Uh, this first slide that you see right here is if we were to uh, go from five elementary schools down to three, pre-K through five, you see the average at the top there being 202 students. This was just a simulation. If we took all of the elementary students and evenly distributed them across three buildings, this would kind of be the average class size. You'll see on the next slide in just a minute that we, um, we actually had to start talking about um, actual buildings because our current facilities don't lend themselves, all of them, to this model. One of the things that's important to notice here is it does reduce those extremes um, by balancing out the numbers. It offers the opportunity for robust music offerings and other allied arts in all of the buildings, fewer part-time positions and more equity um, and responsibilities in this model of three schools. So when we looked at the facilities specifically, um, I'm not gonna talk about the school, but the facility building. We narrowed it down to the Berlin facility, the East Montpelier facility, and the Middlesex facility. And you can see here um, this chart that shows you how many classes um, of each and, and what the sizes would be of each grade level. And at the bottom in the blue, um, you can see the average class size um, across the grades K through three, and then four and five. Um, 
honestly, when we looked at this, we know that um, there might be some variability in where the students go to school if we were to redraw town lines, which is not a project that we engaged in at this time, um, but definitely something to think about. Again, similar to what Stephen showed you, this slide, um, looking at those questions, it does um, fall into EQS um, and achieve the, our district minimum numbers for class size. It does not completely eliminate the part-time staff because we still have some of the schools at about 150 students. Um, it would allow for full-time nursing and counseling. It would allow for opportunities for expanded offerings. Um, there are definitely cost savings and you can see the numbers here for what that would look like to go down to three um, facilities. One big thing um, for further study definitely would be further looking into the transportation, uh, the special education, special education support um, and what that looks like and the allied arts. And I'll just jump in briefly to give a little bit of an update um, on transportation. We have our former um, uh, lead person from first student who knows our district very well doing a transportation analysis. Um, we weren't sure if it would be ready for today and it is not, um, but she is basically looking at these simulations and imagining where you might draw the transportation lines because we know that if we reconfigure we need to make sure that students are um, on the bus for a reasonable amount of time. Um, remember we already bring all students to U32 and we are able to do this largely well um, but she's doing that analysis. So you're going to see transportation in several places that's already been set in motion. And then the other thing I would just add in terms of the numbers, these are numbers that the Finance Committee didn't see and wanted. And these are conservative estimates, meaning um, it's likely that there would be additional reductions, but this would be the people cost from not operating buildings. That's that first number. The cost of no longer needing capital planning projects for two buildings. That's a pretty significant number. Um, and then this just demonstrates classroom classrooms that would be reduced. Um, there would be potential for additional because we would also be reapplying a metric for allied arts and other things. Um, so just to kind of explain that, and then I won't do it on the next one because it looks very similar. Okay, this model looks quite different. So it's actually going from five elementary schools down to two but starting at kindergarten through grade five and having one of our facilities be an early education center beginning at birth, going through pre-K. Um, board, if you remember back in December when you were at East Montpelier and um, were drafting ideas on the chart paper, one of the big things that came out was partnering with our community and, and expanding our childcare um, offerings. This, this um, scenario does that, so it would, partner with community-based child care programs, um, possibly also add child care for staff, have full-time nursing and counseling, stability again for class size variation. It, some of our larger schools, and you'll see numbers in, in the next slide, um, it could create a leadership structure for those schools. This one, as Megan was talking about earlier, would require the vote um, of communities because there would be one of the towns um, not operating a school. Um, it also, this would require a partner for the child care component of the center, right? We would continue to offer pre-K through Washington Central um, before the pre-K would be partnering with, a, with child care. Um, and then we really talked a lot about what, like, what facilities do we have and which ones lend themselves most to this model. Um, and so, um, Megan, if you go to the next slide, the reason we chose Berlin as the facility for the Early Learning Center is that felt like the direction most of our towns may be headed in um, with childcare needs going to work, right? Heading towards Montpelier, Barrie, Interstate, all of that, as opposed to heading away from um, in other towns. Um, so if Berlin were the Early Learning Center, we looked at current numbers, so there would be about six to eight classes of 12 students in our pre-K. If we looked at the East Montpelier facility, there would be roughly about 300 students in that facility. 
utilizing 14 of the 15 classrooms and if we looked at Middlesex facility. The important thing going back to the town lines, we'd have to get very creative, right? And that's where that transportation study would also need to come in because we're looking at five towns going to two schools and, and what that busing and everything would look like. One thing I just want to um, point out in this slide that I didn't mention is that the access to special education for our three and four year olds would dramatically increase because they would be all housed in one building as opposed to as we have it right now housed in five different buildings. Um, and that's something that the, the previous model that I showed you wouldn't have the same impact. And then finally, looking at this model, um, this one actually answers yes to all of the questions. It, it could limit or eliminate partial FTE, optimal class size, continue keeping full-time nursing counselor, um, opportunities for expansion, as Megan shared the cost savings, um, what that might look like. And again, the big study for this one is transportation. Okay, thank you, Stephen and Alicia. Um, so a couple more slides before we do some input and, and um, also just kind of a reminder, again, the board asked us to simulate things, to see what is viable. What does the board think is worth further study? So there are a, a number of things to still figure out with any of these. These are conceptual models that the board asked us for so that the board could decide what needs further study. So I just want to remind us that's the level we're talking about. It's why a lot of these are estimated numbers. Um, we also took a look at um, a couple of different things to illustrate for the board, um, either models that don't meet our configuration criteria that the board gave um, and are really not feasible. But this first one we showed to the board mostly to show the board the magnitude of the size that we serve, because I think sometimes we forget this. Um, there is, um, not just in theory, but there could be one single elementary school that serves all of our students, because 482 is not an exceptionally large school. It's certainly larger than we have. Um, it would have optimal class sizes. It would limit FTE. Obviously, it would have more than one full-time nurse and counselor and lots of potential for offerings um, and significant cost savings. We do not think this is feasible. We don't think this is feasible. We don't think our communities want it. Um, things like transportation would be significant um, and it would require facility expansion even in our largest school. But we offered it to the finance committee just to illustrate what our size really is. Um, the second is our current model. And I think this is really important for the board to see. We don't have optimal class sizes in all of our schools. Um, we have a lot of partial FTE, as, as you know, and you also talk about tonight. Um, if we maintain full-time nursing and counseling, it becomes cost prohibitive um, because of our size. And we really, we don't just have, um, it's not just that we don't have an opportunity for expanded offerings, we don't have the basic offerings in our school. In our smallest schools, we don't have the choral and band programs that we have in our larger schools because we just don't have enough kids to offer them. Um, and as you know, the costs associated with this model um, will continue to increase. Um, I also just wanted to point out that one of the challenges with um, the model that we have is we this year uh, made some decisions around class size uh, because we were presented with very small class sizes. And so we have merged kindergarten and pre-K programs in two of our buildings. When we do that just year by year based on what's coming in, we are not doing it in a thoughtful way across the district. And we'll continue to have to make decisions like that. Um, we also modeled reducing from five elementary schools to four. Um, as sort of a uh, smaller scale change. It only impacts a single building. But as you can see, we are small enough that it actually doesn't achieve the board's priorities. Um, our class sizes would still be small. It would still require um, part-time staff. We would have the same problem with nursing and counseling. 
um, and expanded offerings. And so, yes, there are some potential cost savings, but probably not worth the disruption. So the final slide here, which I won't spend a lot of time on, is just a summary of the three configurations that we showed the board. And there's not a lot of new information here. So to keep us moving, so we are all on a Zoom and there are a lot of us on the Zoom. So uh, this is a little bit of an input session. It is not long. It's also not the only uh, opportunity for input. This is really just to give the board a sense of what the folks in the room feel. Um, in a moment, we are gonna open up Zoom rooms and break into virtual discussion groups. Each of the groups is gonna have a note taker from the district and it's gonna have at least two, if not three board members. Um, and so those are the folks that will move the conversation around or along. Um, we're only gonna be in these rooms for 15 minutes, about five minutes per question. If you don't want to join a room, that is fine. You don't need to. You're gonna get a thing that pops up on your screen that says um, join a room you can just decline it if you don't want to do that. And on the next slide, and I'll also post it in the chat, there's an input opportunity, there's a link. So you will be able to respond to the same questions if you are just someone who'd rather respond that way. Um, then at the end, the board members in each of those rooms will report out two highlights from the conversation. And again, the board. this is just an opportunity early the steering committee felt like it was important for folks to be able to weigh in at some level. Um, and that's what we're about to do. Chris, did you have a question? I do. So um, these breakout rooms are to solicit uh, community input, not board input. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to post paste these questions in the chat so you can also see them later because in a second I'm going to take the share down. But these are the three questions. It's just very simple and five minutes on each. And again, I'm also going to post this link. So if you're someone who would prefer not to um, join a room, that's that's fine. Lord, Megan, can I just say one last thing is that because there's going to be two or three board members per group, we we set it up for six rooms, so it'd be about 25 people per per. For, for some room, it, just decide between you guys who's going to report out the two highlights, okay? That's it. Okay, right. so I'm going to stop the share. And um, Mark, I'm actually going to let you open up the rooms. Hello, everybody. Hi, Ursula, I can kick it off unless there's any board um, feedback. I'm Shannon Miller, I'm a parent um, of a Berlin kiddo and two U32 kids. Um, I'm really surprised to see an early learning center um, listed as a priority. Um, it's very cool as a former parent um, of three little kids, obviously, to see that, but I'm wondering um, if we are struggling right now to fund pre-K through 12, why we are expanding our offerings down to birth. Um, I also am thinking of Washington County Family Center right down the street and knowing that they've frequently had to close due to staffing issues. Um, so I'm just curious if we um, have thought at all about um, being able to find enough licensed individuals to staff um, a center of that size. That's all. Thank you. Do we want to raise hands? Do people just want to jump in popcorn style? Ursula, can, can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. Hi, Kara. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Kara Holden, Director of Special Services. I'm taking notes, and but I don't have access to the form, so I'm just going to take them in my own and then upload it. Can you remind me which question we're on so I can categorize correctly? So the, the three questions, I got to go find mine. 
the three questions were what excites you? Okay. And so if we, like, I think um, Shannon sort of went into maybe a few, like she answered all three, I think. Okay. Can you and remind I, me of the other two so I can? Yep. What excites you? What questions yep. do you have? And what concerns do you have? Okay, so I will summarize Shannon's within those, and then I'll let you facilitate them here. Thank you. Okay. I see Honey's hand up, so take it away. Hi. I have a question and a concern. I have a question as to how we would create 12 classrooms at Rumney. Um, currently, there are nine. So is there an associated cost with changing the building, or are we looking to take away spaces such as art? music and library to create those additional three classrooms. Um, and my, that was my question. My concern is um, that Stephen proposed that we need to wait to reconfigure to, um, so the current staff at U32 can be ready to teach sixth grade. Um, some of us are sixth grade teachers. I am a sixth grade teacher and that just felt, um, that felt like a goodbye. Like, sorry, you teach sixth grade right now, but we're going to take our staff and we're going to make it work with them. Um, and I know that's not what he's thinking, but I just want to be really have have him be really thoughtful in that presentation because we have very talented sixth grade teachers right now who um, should be considered for the position, even if it's not um, where it's currently at right now. Thanks. Thank you. I saw Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth, did you have your hand up next? Yep, you guys just are going in order. So I'll call on Elizabeth. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I am a parent of twins at Callis Elementary and a daughter at U32 in seventh grade. Um, and I too share the concern about uh, focusing on opening more early ed programs. Ironically, I'm an early ed director and it is a wonderful thing and we should do more of it. But when I think about the current children in our district, I really feel like that has to be the, our first focus and a focus that we consider through all of these different steps. Um, I'm excited that if there is a merge of schools that there will be more arts and more band and music opportunities. Callis has wonderful music programs, but it'd be great to be able to see that expand for our kiddos, especially for those that have different um, modes of communication and excitement and learning. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say is that uh, as a parent of children who are in a program that has smaller class sizes, um, one of the configurations, I can't remember which one it was, I wanna say down to two, two schools maybe, the class sizes were way, way, way too big. Um, I get the idea that adding more staff to a classroom will help to balance things out, but often more does not mean better. Um, especially in situations where you have the kids that we have right now that we're educating that are experiencing a lot of trauma, a lot of mental health needs. So for me, smaller is better, and I would steer far away from configurations that increase this class sizes significantly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Larry Gilbert, except I don't think that this is a Larry Gilbert. I'm not sure. Hi. Uh, oh, yes. it, is. Okay. it is. It is Larry Gilbert. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. Um, what's exciting? What's exciting for me to hear is the thoughtfulness that has gone into this process to date. Uh, the, there's a, been a lot of sort of loose talk in the community, it seems, um, about, about closings uh, and reconfiguration, but this is the first sort of concrete and um, specific uh, proposals that I have heard. And so I'm really delighted that this process is moving. I don't have an opinion on, you know, what schools ought to close, how many, whether the, the right number is three or four or two or, or even one. That's an interesting proposal. But um, what's exciting for me is that um, the thoughtfulness that has gone in so far. Thanks. Thank you. Hannah? Hi there. Um, yeah, so what's exciting uh, to me, again, is the, if, if, it, if it really shakes out this way, the increased opportunity for um, um, enrichment uh, across the district. So I'm thinking if it means that world languages, which are unbelievable, um, 
in Middlesex could be expanded, um, that would be that would be a boon um, to everyone. I it's exciting to think about um, uh, my kiddos, um, you know, having meeting more friends, more people. Um, right now, uh, Dodie and Rumney do a lot together. Um, girls on the run, basketball. That's been that's been really neat to see um, meet more people. Um, so that's exciting to me. Um, I share the same concerns. I mean, I, so I have a 15 month old and the idea of, and, and he's been on, he had, Turtle Island has a wait list 300 kids long. That's a wait list. That's not enrollment. That's a wait list. And I've gotten the same thing from the Montpelier Children's House, even though we have whatever. I mean, the wait list is 160 kids long and he's been on a wait list since I was three months pregnant. So that's exciting, but I also think it's the wrong direction. Um, which says a lot because, wow, could I use an early child care center? Um, but we're dealing with such massive cuts that that just seems uh, like the wrong place to focus. I'm also, um, I am concerned about having, about having pre-K at a place different from where those pre-K kiddos will end up going to elementary school. I think there is a ton of value and going and having your pre-K be your introduction to your school. I think that's so valuable. And I, I th what they were talking about with um, special education being uh, being more um, of an option for little littles, maybe if there are three elementary schools, we'll, we'll still have that increase. Um, but I see the kiddos, and I know from my kids' experience and, and in their classrooms, kids that get that introduction to their schools and their school community have a much smoother transition in kindergarten, both in terms of the place they're at and they already know the teachers and they're going from, I mean, my God, now we're down to two and a half hours, but it used to be five hours to a, to a six and a half hour day. So I think that um, that's a big concern of mine if pre-K, and, and we're already dealing with that with Romney and Jody um, this next calendar year. And that's a, that's a concern of mine. Um, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Mark? Hi. Um, lower my hand when I finish and figure out the buttons. Uh, excited. I have two kids. Sorry, I teach at U32, and we have two kids at Calis Elementary, fifth grader and a third grader. Um, excited about increased opportunities, music, art, um, what did I even say? Drama, band, just all the things, right? That'd be great to have. Oh, language, world language. I would love if my kid could get language, so that's all good. Um, I'm very, would be very concerned if we went to the two elementary school model. I know the statement was made that a lot of our communities go in that direction. I know a lot of my neighbors don't go in that direction. And to send your very young child all the way to Berlin from Callis that's closer to Hardwick than to Montpelier is, is a lot. Um, so I, I don't support that move at all. Um, yeah, those are the main things. I'm excited about increased opportunities. I'm really concerned about the idea of sending all of our communities to somewhere that far away for so many of them for the youngest kids. Thank you. Thank you. Ashlyn. Hi, my name's Tyler Smith. I'm a teacher at Berlin. My wife, Ashlyn, also a teacher at Berlin and we both live in Berlin. I'm also a co-president of the association. Um, what it's, what excites me, I have a daughter who's, uh, in sixth grade currently, um, and it, it excites me that kids will be able to grow up and have more opportunities than she had. She had some wonderful opportunities, but world language, like Mark said, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I am worried about just reconfiguration and, uh, not enough thought being put into how we choose which model to do. I think I'm not going to echo a lot of the concerns that were already said, but um, schools that are too crammed, um, I feel like that that is definitely not what our communities want. Um, and what was the third one? I'm so sorry. So it excites, concerns, any questions that you have? Understanding we're uh, not answering them in this yep. situation. Yep. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. This was lovely to be able to do this in this forum. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Honey. 
Can I just oh. say one more thing? Um, as someone who currently works at one of the smaller schools that um, might be dispersed elsewhere, um, it's worth saying a hundred different ways that we need to be so thoughtful in how we um, make this reconfiguration happen. It can't just be that some of the bigger schools are absorbing the small schools. There really needs to be a lot of agency put into it um, from leadership all the way down and including families um, because it's a pretty drastic change and we want everyone to be a part of uh, making it successful. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, I should be able to speak in the moment since I do this professionally, but um, I forgot my third grader is in a class of between 20 and 25. It's a combined third and fourth grade class, of course, but it's not ideal. It's it, it seems to be too many. He's got an excellent teacher who runs the room really well and I have nothing but respect for her. She does a great job, but it's too many. So that idea of going down to two schools and making a lot of classes between 20 and 25 I'd be concerned about that, particularly for the younger classes. Thank you. Julia. Hi, my name is Julia Gukas. I'm the principal at Berlin Elementary. Honey, I just, one thing that Alicia didn't mention in the presentation, but I know the configuration group has talked about is that if we were to move forward with a three um, campus model or three elementary schools, the reason why she chose or they chose in the language Berlin facility is that the idea would be that there would be or, a, you know, the Rumney facility would be that there would be a reimagining of a name for the elementary school so that it doesn't just become an absorption, that it's a creation of a new learning community in a different site, if that makes sense. I just when you said that, I was like, great, right, we didn't talk about that. So um, that's I just wanted to note that. Thank you, Celia. Of course. I'm just looking for hands. Any other comments anybody wants to share? Natasha, did they give us a time limit? Or? They said 15 minutes, but I don't know when we came into the room. I did not look at my clock. I, didn't, I did not yeah. do that part of facilitating. We did get a to-do of identifying two, two items to share out. Hi, Hannah. Hi again. It's so weird not to be pressed for time. I do really appreciate this um, format. Um, I, I want to um, piggyback and, and say that... Um, if there were a choice between three and two, I would think that if 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 two elementary schools meant that, you know, we were at 25 for every class, um, that does seem like it would be it would be a lot to, too much to handle. I mean, I know when my kiddo was in kindergarten, what was that? Um, honey will know that was 21 or 22 kids um, and 22 kindergartners. I mean, it was 21. Um, it was. <laughs> A full-time teacher and then technically a para but really a full-time certified teacher um so it was really two certified teachers in that classroom um and that was that was bare minimum i think to, to make that work and, and i agree i mean my my older kiddo had 10 kids and that was amazing because it was that covid year that we were back in school um but on the other hand like i do i do understand having a few more for an enriching experience but but i agree with the, the previous comment um that that I think that's stretching capacity. Thank you. Do mm -hmm. we want to look for common themes? I mean, in the excites category, I heard plenty of you talk about excitement about expanded opportunities for students within mm -hmm. reconfiguration. Yeah. Natasha, you and I get to duke it out over who presents when we go out. Not it. Oh, I see. I see. That was a big step back. Gotcha. Hannah, is your hands up again? Like no. Or I, okay. I just want to check. Figure out how to put it down. Fair enough. Um. So one of them that we will put report out would be um an excitement from our group being expanded opportunities. What about between either questions or concerns? 
do you guys want to Kara, I see your hand up. Yeah, I'm just looking at the notes. Um, the concern, if I was to summarize it, is all pretty consistent about um, understanding that we're thinking through this, but uh, but not swinging the pendulum too far. So too far, too fast, or um, going from too small to too big. So um, what excites people is the idea of kids having more resources and opportunities. And then the concern is the other side of that pendulum, which is too far too fast or going too big. I would just add and be an observational here. Um, another like a, a zoom out observation or summary could be to share that people did a pretty tremendous job of identifying and honoring how this feels for people in the community and talking this through in a structured way that put it all out in the, on the table without um, offending. There's been a lot of murmurings in the community that this will be hard and, and from an observational place, this was really productive and constructive and service to our kids. Thank you, Kara. And then it's Ashlyn and Tyler, right? Yep. Um, just, I came up with my question. Has it been brought up, uh, any question about what would cuts look like if we went to two schools, uh, like what would staffing look like if we went to two or three schools? How does that all kind of lay out? I can only briefly, just because they threw those numbers up on the screen, they have very roughly looked at those numbers and what the cuts would look like um, because the school contract, like the, the teacher's contract and the education support staff contracts would have a large amount of play in that too. So it is a complicated issue that requires more thought and explorations. Celia and then we'll do Michael. Tyler, there if you look in the um go in the chat on Zoom, there's a link to the slides and they're the longer rec it's like the rectangular box that takes up all the page looking at one configuration. Um one other I was thinking like noticing that I had heard um sort of was that there was a worry about shifting to looking at a birth to five center. I heard that through kind of a th pull through thread um, of, to Kara's point, like not rushing into a decision, but I also heard a concern about focusing on younger students without first figuring out how to serve our K to pre-K to six population that's currently in our district. And if it serves this group, I can add that to our too big, too far, too fast. Um, concern that we report out. We'll just smoosh two things into one. Michael. Yeah, g'day, I'm Michael Shellen. I'm the PBIS and Behaviour Coach at East Montpelier Elementary. Um, just thinking about transportation, no matter what model um, is looked at more closely or any of the models, um, can we include uh, increased supervision on bus routes, considering that kids may spend longer on buses and um, that's probably the least supervised place in our schools right now. And just as a as a question, can we look at um, increasing supervision on those bus routes? Thank you. And Kara's taking those notes. So all the questions will come to the committee and we have like three seconds. So we're all... Recording you know, in progress. Chris, I... The, the other 10,000 gorilla in the room is Montpelier. You know, we talk about the five towns. I, you know, I agree with you. I thought was having that same thought. We, we, have this, we, we have this whole other school district sitting in the middle, and it doesn't come up at all. It's, it's really where, It's kind of crazy. Well, you know, bring it up, because I'm just going to say, this is sounds like a time when we should really be talking with Montpelier. Before oh, we yeah. Hey, buddy, we're, hey okay. Alan and Chris. Thank yeah. you. I know it was hard. We were caught in the middle too in our group. I just want to re say again that this won't be the last time that people will get to give feedback and we're going to have a, a survey. So we'll go around and, and share two, two highlights per, per group. So if you guys have your spokesperson, you know, which we, is going to be we, really hard because there was a lot uh, to be shared. So are you the spokesperson for your group, Chris? Um, actually, our group was Alan, Lila, and I, uh, because we were in the general session, and I got never made it into my breakout group, 
And Mark was just working madly to try to get us back in. And then okay, Alan so, and then Alan so, go, so then Chris, hold on Chris. and then hold, so go, so hold go ahead, go to now. group one. Go to group one. Thanks, Chris. Oh, but, but what we talked about really? talked about a couple of things. One is um, the importance of the small of the small schools to small towns and their vibrancy uh, that we need to to take into account. Uh, the other is this almost sounds like a good time to start talking with Montpelier. Uh, to see what their plans are, and before we make any steps, and and those those two things, um, and and Alan yep. also was concerned about we should be talking about the budget. But go ahead. We, we, we are getting to the budget. Okay. Yeah. Right. Really? Great. Um, so we had a really great group and a really nice discussion. I think there was a lot of excitement and hope in hearing the presentations for reconfiguration, just thinking about instead of student numbers dwindling and resources dwindling, kind of this reversal and this burgeoning of resources and, and students being, being together. So that was one main takeaway and definitely highlight. I think the, the main questions and concerns that are remaining are a lot about um, busing and how both how long children are going to be on buses, kind of how we figure that out. So I know that that, that study is is coming. And then also um, a, a nudge to uh, look at the impacts of, or our impacts on, on climate change associated with um, the these reconfiguration scenarios with the additional busting. Um, so that was it from our side. Thank you, Keely. Uh, Natasha, Joshua, and Ursula, who's your spokesperson for your group? Go ahead, Ursula. Um, so within our group, we had an overarching excitement towards expanded opportunities and enrichment for students. Um, some of the main concerns that were brought up were that they don't want to go too far, too fast, too big with our options and a worry about shifting concentrations to a birth to five center if we aren't fully um, taking care of the students we currently have. Thank you. Uh, Michaela and Zach. Okay, so we we had a lot of a lot of energy and a lot of excitement around you know, the idea that we could you know, bring you know bring services back or strengthen services, particularly in, in the arts and particularly in, in music, making that more robust in larger schools. Um, what one concern that came up a number of times, you know, was for, you know, for teachers around the transition of sixth grade to, um, you know, to the high school, which is a lot of uncertainty around what does that mean for licensure? What does that mean for who can teach what? How is that in, going to impact, you know, who, you know, who is, you know, you know, who's going to still have a job and who won't? And so I think there were a lot of, it's, it was all, you know, it was really framed as question yeah, as questions. I think it, they are real questions, but it's it, it's a thing that's a stressor right now. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Diane, we're group number four. Do you want to report out? Sure. Um, so again, reiterating this uh, excitement over the increase of you know opportunities. Uh, some of the big concerns and questions that were coming up were around the specifics. What you know, the devil's in the details. And so when we're saying the increased opportunities, what does that really mean? What are those costs that are going to be there? Also, a uh, very strong feeling that um, how are we making the decisions as to which uh, which schools do we keep and expand? Are we What are the values that we're applying to that? What are we looking at in terms of is it size or is it um, the, um, you know, there are many examples of the, the closeness and the strength of smaller schools and, uh, the deep generational connections there. And so really questions around the specifics of that expense, it did come up about Montpelier. And so I think it just raises a lot of questions and a lot of wonderings about the process about in terms of, um, how we gather that information and make sure there are lots of voices at the table. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Amelia and Jonathan? So in our group, it, it also echoed um, a lot of the similar themes that have been discussed, um, a lot of the, the same uh, points of excitement about increased opportunities, especially for sixth graders, um, if they were to come to U32, and um, a lot of excitement around childcare. And some of the key questions, um, 
were around concerns for supporting communities through the transition. How do we sort of strengthen the connections and the bonds and relationships in the midst of that transition that could be um, disruptive and, and you know, really challenging? Um, and um, questions about class sizes, um, specifically what's, what, what are the optimal class sizes and in relation to a comment that, um, that was from experience of having, you know, a, a class that felt too big. Um, concerns about transportation and licensure logistics. So fitting with the theme. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, Michelle and Daniel. Okay, so things that were exciting were um, the possibility of having a child care for the younger children and maybe for our employees to be able to access. Also the um, increased opportunities for students um, in the merge, such as specialized reading programs that some use and some don't, world language. A lot of the questions also, I feel are part of the concerns. Um, you know, how do we repurpose a school so that, you know, it's a still a vibrant place for the community members. Um, there was questions about how do we make it so our students don't feel like they're just absorbed, like swallowed into another elementary school, which, you know, talking, we talked about like the naming of the school, like if Callis went to East Montpelier, we wouldn't want to still call it East Montpelier. Um, those types of things. Um, transportation was another concern. Um, kids being on the bus for, you know, either really early or for how long. So, um, and what, what will it look like for children's, you know, for the children based on a larger school? Thank you, Michelle. So, so uh, again, this is not the last time that you guys will have an opportunity. This is an ongoing process and we'll, you know, we'll keep reaching out to the community and nothing is in stone yet. This is where we are at this moment. It, we're gonna take a five minute break so that we can dive in uh, and stretch just for a minute so we can have our heads back for the important conversation about the budget. Uh, so is 18, five, sorry, six, I don't know. Because I'm in at the 7:43. Uh, we'll be. Let's just be back at uh, at at eight. Uh, at eight sorry, uh, can here. Back in five minutes. Okay. See you soon. Recording stopped.
Okay, everybody, one more minute and just turn your cameras on board members when you're on. And if you can't turn your cameras on, that's okay, but at least they'll know that or give me a thumbs up so I know that you're ready. I know it's a lot. It's a little bit of a marathon today, but it's all linked together. And it's... see your thumbs up, Diane. Recording in progress. So we're going to move into the budget presentation, and then we'll have time for for comments after the budget presentation, and then the board will have time to deliberate. Okay. So with that, I'm going to give it back to you, Megan, to huh? share your screen and get us started. Yep. And Suzanne. Yep. So um. I'll get us started uh, a couple times. I'll turn to other folks on the leadership team. Suzanne will also um, take a good portion of this. So um, we've just spent a lot of time talking about things that we normally start a budget conversation with, which is this is what we're trying to do for kids. Um, so what you're about to see doesn't repeat that because you just spent um, a lot of time on it. But um, again, our job as a leadership team is to take the direction of the board, in this case, the financial direction, and what the board expects our schools to do for kids and bring the board proposals based on that. Um, just kind of a reminder, this is part of a broader budget development timeline. We are not normally still meeting about the budget at this time of year, um, but as you know, the budget did not pass on town meeting day. And so um, the board has asked for proposals today for discussion um, and will be adopting a revised budget by next week in order to meet a timeline for a May 7th revote. And here's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to review what the board parameters were and the requests they made of administration. And then we're going to move into those budget proposals. We will talk a little bit about some themes from the various input um, opportunities. We'll summarize the changes in each proposal that the board asked, and we will look a little bit at tax rate projections. Um, again, these are three different calculations based on what the board asked for. Some information that you would normally get and will be part of a, a forward-facing budget presentation, we will develop those once the board adopts a budget. Um, so kind of a review of the parameters the board set, the direction they gave administrators, and then therefore our approach. Um, this you are quite familiar with. Um, these are the original parameters from the board uh, during the budget process. Um, it is a combination of things the board would, needs our school to do and cost-related parameters. Um, the board did, back in November, remove the parameter of keeping our costs um, at the inflation rate um, because, for many reasons, the costs are significantly above the inflation rate. So this is not new information. And at your <laughs> post vote meeting, your first meeting as a board, um, this is the direction you gave. Um, so for a number of reasons, especially this year, the tax rate projections are incredibly volatile and they are changing. So um, that's actually always true, but it's especially true this year. It's also always true that the part of the budget the board controls is spending. And so the board has opted to focus on spending because that is the part you have control over. The original proposed budget that did not pass represented a 16.14% net education spending increase. And you have asked us to model bringing that increase down to a 10% increase, an 8% increase, and a 6% increase. And that represents these numbers of additional reductions. So these are in addition to the reductions proposed in the budget that did not pass. So leadership team continues to use this set of principles to guide their work. Um, we need to be able to achieve our vision and our pillars. 
within our current configuration, as you heard during the configuration study, none of those movements can happen in time for the FY25 budget. Um, we need to make sure our staffing resources remain within education quality standards, and we need to respond to enrollment changes. So that was the principles that administration used in doing the work. So I'm going to go through a set of slides, some quicker than others, because some you've seen before, and this is going to talk through the three different proposals um, that you asked for. Just a reminder, um, you've seen this slide before. This is sort of your engagement process during the typical budget season. It starts with what is it that we're trying to accomplish? There's opportunity to communicate um, and get feedback from staff and from community, and then the board does its work. I'm reiterating this slide um, for those of you that already that were here for the configuration presentation. This is the same uh, slide. We did put out a thought exchange after the budget failure. Um, that is not a perfect method of gathering input, but I would say this is the most responded survey we've ever given. Um, so the way thought exchange works is people make comments, but they also can um, uh, emphasize other people's comments or rate other people's comments. So the thing that's important for the board to hear is um, these are the highest num frequency of comments. So about 22% of the comments are about supporting the need to reconfigure. Um, a lot of really articulate ways of saying that, and I'm not doing justice to it, a lot of comments like, we know this is hard, we know this is something that our communities uh, feel really strongly about, and we think it's time. So that's kind of my summary. Um, there's a lot of comments, about 18% of the comments standalone are about um, our continued increase in costs are really difficult for our communities, and they're feeling like reductions are necessary. Um, there is that's about 18%. And those top two comments are also the highest rated um, comments. Um, there is also feedback in the survey about um, administrative positions and sort of the idea of looking across line item areas. Um, about 4% of the comments are about preserving opportunities for students and making sure that services aren't impacted. Um, and then there's a number of, of comments it is only 2%, but I think it's relevant um, for the board to be really clear about its communication for the next round. This is a slide you've seen before. Um, this is just reiterating our enrollment decline. Um, and the reason we're repeating this slide is because a lot of what we're gonna talk with you about is um, sizing our district for the number of students we serve right now, which is far fewer than we've served in the past. And this is just that same chart in a um, visual form. It's important for the board to know that these changes, which were in your adopted budget on January 17th, are already assumed in this budget. So everything we're going to talk about is in addition to this, right? So this, as you remember, the board um, agreed on these proposals. Um, and so these are factored in already. And I won't review them because we uh, went through that in detail as part of that budget process. So the first thing that I will highlight is um, this is the 10% net education spending increase. So again, we're currently at 16. This is bringing that down to 10, which is about $1.9 million in additional reduction. Um, we'll talk about this in a few different places. Um, when I finish talking, I'll talk a little bit about fund balance. Um, but this is what is included in this proposal. Um, one is um, we did a deep dive into our uh, non-personnel line items. Um, and made supply line reductions across the board. Um, there is an interest line adjustment that we made. Um, the magnitude of those numbers, it's about $260,000 in supply line reductions, $112,000 in interest line adjustments. A lot of these numbers are in the um, memo that's on the website for those of you on the screen. 
And um, the thing to understand about those reductions is um, these non-personnel line items are where a school district often generates fund balance. Um, that and, and unfilled positions is another place. But what that means is the budget is tighter. So it is likely that we would earn, for lack of a better word, um, or accrue less fund balance. So that's just something to be aware of. This proposal for the 10% increase includes a reduction of the director of technology position. So that is a central office leadership position um, that we would reduce. Um, the, there will be a small professional services uh, contract that would need to remain to carry forward our cybersecurity needs in particular. Um, as you know, the district was the victim of a cyber attack a number of years ago, and we need to keep those protections going. Um, but this is a reduction of this leadership position. The second set of th these next two pieces here, um, the board heard recommendations last year from administration uh, for a number of reductions, and the board chose to re restore those reductions. They are put back into this proposal at 10%. Um, in addition, the uh, nurse and counselor positions, these are ESSER funded positions. ESSER money has gone away. Um, this was part of your original budget proposal and those are included in these reductions. There are a number of reductions that are related to enrollment. Um, I also would just say these previously proposed reductions are also related to enrollment. Um, we serve fewer students than we served six, 10 years ago, and we'll continue to serve fewer students. We have not significantly reduced staffing to match that reduced service, uh, reduced number of students. So there are classroom teacher related reductions that it are um, directly tied to our enrollment decreases. Um, there's a administrative assistant vacancy at U32, and there are a number of allied arts reductions. Um, again, these reductions preserve the number of classes per week. Um, I'm going to turn to Alicia, um, kind of speaking on behalf of the elementary principals, to talk a little bit more about allied arts. Uh, we know there's been a couple of questions about how those reductions were made. Sure. So I'm going to give you more context than uh, and kind of backstory than you're you're used to getting from us. But we thought it was important because you are going to see you've heard from allied arts teachers, and you're also going to see uh, different variations of allied arts in different percentages um, in this budget presentation. So. Um, in an elementary school day, right, the day is broken up into chunks. We have um, several years ago, the leadership team came up with agreements where all consistently across the schools of our allied arts blocks would be 45 minutes. Before that time, we could range anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes in different buildings, and our students were not all getting consistent uh, time with each of the teachers. What we didn't do at that time is look in our buildings at the FTEs and the personnel that it required to have those 45 minute blocks. So for example, if you look at the school day, and I think it was Erica who had talked about this earlier tonight when she said this six block kind of idea, you can fit in a, in a master schedule, you can fit up to six blocks of allied arts in a day. You can fit three before lunch, typically and three after lunch. If you, you know, do the math and multiply 45 minutes times six, it's 270 minutes of a day that you could fit any one of those teachers um, in front of children. A school day is 420 minutes long for a, for a student in elementary school. So not all of that day of the allied arts teacher would be teaching students even with those six blocks. Um, but the math that we use to kind of calculate looking looking broadly across all of these categories. So we looked at art specifically, we looked at music, we looked at library and we looked at PE. And we talked about each of them as individuals. We know that a PE teacher and an art teacher have a whole lot more equipment set up 
than maybe uh, some of the other arts because um, as Erica shared with you earlier, there's a lot of takedown and cleaning and, and um, setting up that happens. We also know that other arts like our music teachers might not just be teaching general music in some of our buildings, we have band, we have um, chorus, right? So we took all of that into consideration and we looked at library. Um, some of our librarians strictly teach library and others teach both library and tech, more similar to a PE teacher where they're in front of students twice a week. We also know that they um, have the whole circulation to think about. And um, it's not just about being in front of kids for librarians, as you heard earlier. There's a lot of other time spent, not when kids are in the room, um, preparing for and making sure that the circulation is, is in order and up to date. So we looked at all of those factors when we came up with these FTEs. Um, we had not done this work several years ago and we, we kind of had that consistency in number of minutes. Um, and so what you see here in the 10%, the 0.8 decrease in art and 0.6 decrease in library is across all of our buildings. What we have not yet done and um, I believe the next steps would be, would be to meet with those art teachers and to look at what are the FTEs that remain and how do we distribute them across our buildings. So it wouldn't be that any one art teacher would be in all five buildings. That's not the best use of their time, um, nor would that be fair to them to ask them to be in you know, five buildings every week. Um, so that that step has not yet happened. Basically, what we did is we looked at the kind of a master schedule, thought about what that would look like and what the needs would be in each of our buildings, looking at number of classrooms we have for next year. Thank you, Alicia. Appreciate it. This this uh, set of reductions to get us to ten percent assumes using about 273,000, actually almost $274,000 in fund balance. Um, when we get to the end of these three, I'll have Suzanne speak a little bit about fund balance. And the, um, as you know, the board had this conversation a little bit in March. Um, we have, uh, we are advised to have 2% of our operating costs in fund balance retained. And then we have money outside of that. And we have a lot of unforeseen um, potential costs coming down, particularly around PCBs. And so the board asked Suzanne to think about an amount of fund balance that she was comfortable with that put, does not put the district at a significant amount of risk, but allows you um, to use it. So she will talk a little bit about that. This proposal here assumes using just under $274,000 of fund balance. The board asked to look at a 8% net spending increase. So that is about two and a half million of additional reductions from that December, uh, January 17th budget. This assumes $485,000 in fund balance applied. And it is the reductions on the previous slide plus some additional allied arts reductions. The reason these allied arts reductions are on the 8% and not the 10% is because although the reductions don't occur at U32, the implications of the reductions move people around K-12. Allied Arts licenses are K-12, um, and it makes this pretty complicated. Um, it does not decrease services for students. It still maintains those agreements about Allied Arts. It's just more complicated, frankly, from a human resources perspective. And that's why it's on a column that in our mind is still doable, but it's more challenging. Um, and so the, the calculations that Alicia was talking about, those are what um, landed these here. The only real difference again is the complexity it makes for the adults in our system. Um, it still preserves student services. Um, there are additional administrative reductions in this proposal, um, not significant position cuts, but taking our, uh, uh, currently the Gillian, the Doty position, the Doty principal is a 0 0.9, it's, it's a 0.89. Um, it's a, a redu reduced contract 
number of contract days. So this proposal would have our other two smallest schools also be reduced by that amount. And it would bring the DOTI position down a little bit further to a 0.8. You board have heard me say before, um, I believe the time to reduce administrative positions, principal positions, uh, we have reduced administrative positions, that's in the 10% column, but principal positions, my perspective is that if we are operating a school, we need a principal to operate that school. Um, and so the time to make those reductions is in um, within the context of configuration. Um, we know folks have asked about the leadership numbers at U32. There's a slide in a little bit that shows those numbers. We really don't have the data to support reductions in administration at U32. I'll talk about that in a second. And then there are some additional enrollment related reductions in this 8% proposal. Um, we have some administrative assistant reductions. Again, these are number of contract days uh, rather than elimination of positions. And it is to sort of bring alignment to the small schools. Um, Rumney retains a 1.0 nurse. It was never ESSER funded. And that would actually make Rumney have more nursing um, in terms of distribution of resources than other schools. So there is a 0.2 nurse reduction in this proposal, a small reduction in um, a yoga offering at U32. And this proposal would also reduce two bus routes. Um, we actually believe that we may be able to reduce more, but two is a conservative estimate. And um, I might have to actually, uh, I will come back to you with what that dollar amount is. We have a per bus route dollar amount that I had written down in a different place and I will come back and tell you what that is. So this is the 8%. And again, that assumes about $485,000 in fund balance to get us there. The final proposal that the board asked us for is a 6% net ed spending increase. That's about $3.2 million in additional reductions. This applies the biggest proportion of fund balance, 864,000, and it includes the previous reductions um, plus a reduction in building and grounds at U32 um, and support staff positions. If you'll recall, um, U32 has perennial vacancies in support staff, um, and this would not fill two additional of those positions. I'm actually, Suzanne, I'm gonna do the next slide because it's related to ed quality. I'll let you speak to the fund balance um, when I turn it over to you for numbers. So this slide, you've seen different versions of this, but this is just showing the board that the reductions that we have uh, proposed, and this chart assumes all of the reductions all the way down to 6%. And we're just putting this here to show you that even with those reductions, we remain within education quality standards um, in each of these areas. The green highlights are just the areas, the functional area that shows up on the list of reductions. So that's what this chart is. Um, and again, the uh, administrative data is in here as well. And it's looked at in two ways. Ed quality standards looks at that by how many teachers an administrator supervises, we added some information about the total student body that they serve. And I will turn it over to Suzanne. Uh, good evening. Uh, just a reminder, as we look at the slide, that the budgeted expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend, which is the dollar amount that is warned and voted on. Revenues represent the money the district anticipates receiving to offset expenditures. In all three drafts presented on this slide, the revenues include a proposed amount of fund balance. The net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes and is used to develop the local spending per pupil that the homestead tax rate is based upon. Draft one is a proposal that utilizes $273,912 of the fund balance to offset expenditures to lower the net education spending. Uh, draft two, $485,000. And draft three utilizes $864,000 to lower the, the net education spending. In the past, the board has utilized the fund balance to support 
the retirement buyout, unanticipated spending in special education, and investing in the capital improvement reserve fund. Several factors were weighed when considering how much fund balance to use to reduce the tax impact. The across the board cuts made in each draft represent significant belt tightening across the district and will result in the generation of less fund balance in the future. There is still an unknown amount of money that will need to be spent to mitigate PCBs at U32 and possibly the other schools in the district, which is why you're not seeing us take the entire amount of your fund balance and say, um, let's use it to offset this. <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons that we have encouraged the board to focus more on the net education spending and less on the tax rate is the impact of the decrease in the CLA across each of our towns. This factor is out of the board's control, and yet it is one of the largest factors in the increase in the individual town tax rates. So we just have this slide in here for a reminder of those CLA reductions. No, if the Washington central budget continues to fail uh, at subsequent votes, the district would be required by statute to begin July 1 on an operating budget that is 87% of the FY24 budget. Uh, what you see on this slide is the local edu education spending models for the 10%, 8%, and 6% increases. And it shows you what the equalized homestead tax rate projection is for each of those budgets. Uh, note that the 10% is a negligible increase, almost a level funded uh, amount in that equalized homestead tax rate. Both the 8% and the 6% are decreases in the equalized tax rates. Okay, I didn't do the right one. <laughs> Um, what you see here are the estimated changes in taxes on a $100,000 house uh, for the 10% um, education spending increase. You're seeing Berlin at a 340, Callis at 208, East Montpelier 335, Middlesex 267, and Worcester 152. And for each of these, you'll want to take that number and multiply it by whatever increment of 100000 you have for a home. So if you have a $300,000 house, you would multiply that number by three to see exactly how much of an increase you would see in your taxes. And here I wanted to provide you with some general information regarding Vermont statewide education funding system and how it is connected to the budget that the voters adopt. Only 33% of the school district education spending for FY24 was funded through the Homestead Education Tax. So that's the year that we're currently operating in. The remaining 32% came from non-Homestead property taxes and 35% came from the General Education Fund from the state. As you know, the property yield is an important factor in determining the Homestead property tax rate. The property yield is set based on overall statewide education spending. Since a significant number of school district budgets have not passed and many like ours are not yet warned, the Agency of Education has not provided an updated projection of the property yield. Homestead property taxes are adjusted for household income in the majority of households in the district. And I'm prepared to provide the board with income sensitivity information. Since this is an additional layer of complexity, one that we haven't gone over in the past budget presentations, it would be best to present it uh, based upon an adopted budget for the board. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm gonna stop the sharing and Floor, I will turn it over to you. Hey, so before the board starts the deliberation, we, we have a, a, a period right now when a community members can make, a, can make comments. So if you have a specific comment to the budget, Right now, please raise your hand and we'll listen to your comments. Uh, okay, I'm going to give a minute more to see how many people we have. And then the board will start deliberating and there won't be a back and forth with the community. So, okay, perfect. I'm seeing a few more. Okay, 
Suzanne uh, is two minutes and you can get started. Introduce yourself and go ahead. Hi, um, Suzanne Loudon. I'm in Middlesex and I have two kids at Romney. Um, I guess I'm confused by the lower enrollment, meaning that the students that are still present in the schools don't deserve a full-time nurse. Um, you know, there are kids in the school with anxiety, worry that, you know, form a relationship with that nurse and it keeps them in school and keeps them from being sent home. Um, there's also kids in these schools that have serious health conditions, you know, type one diabetes, seizure disorders. So by not having a full-time nurse in these schools, you're putting these kids at risk and you're creating an unsafe environment for them. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Meredith? Um, I actually had a very similar comment, both about the, I, it might be that I just didn't understand what the changes meant for the nurse and counselor positions. Um, it, it looked to me like we were losing time at Doty and maybe it looked also at Callis um, for both the counselor positions and the school nurse positions. Um, and both of those are really beneficial as not just, especially the nurse, not just as your standard, you know, somebody has a cut, but very much into the emotional well-being of the children. Um, and trying, especially when you have a team where your teacher is engaged full time with the class as a whole. And if you have a student who isn't at a level where they have one on one help, having the counselor and having the nurse there as that um, additional assistance for a team approach to children who may not need the one on one assistance, but still need a team of people to assist them when their teacher can't take one-on-one -on -one time with them um, is really crucial. And it feels, I, I understand the budget numbers, but when we're looking at, at a goal being to make sure that all students are at a facility where they have those full-time assists, it seems like a um, short-term situation that could do a lot of damage that's the opposite of what the board's goals are long term even in just maybe two years that's what i have thank you tracy thompson go ahead Hi. tracy uh, sure it's uh tracy legalist it's my old name on there um but yeah um middlesex parent and um i i guess i just wanted to make um I, I mean, I'd like to ask the board to go in the direction of the 10% increase, uh, um, the, the, the most generous one that allows for the few, fewer cuts. Um, I, I think, you know, Flora, you started this convert, this whole meeting by saying that you, we want to be heading in a sustainable direction for, for the schools. And I, I think, you know, we presented the cons consolidation options and I just, I don't think that the, we are at, we that the board has really found what that sustainable direction is. And I don't think it's wise to make big, big cuts until we know like what direction the board wants to go with all of this. We have all these options out here, but no one knows really where we're headed. And until we know where we're headed, I just don't think it's wise to make significant cuts. Once, once some of these programs go away, it's hard to get them back like the world language program at Romney and the, and the nursing once they're gone. And once we've watered down Romney, like how do we get it back? Especially when we're looking at Romney as a school that will be receiving additional students. Um, if I'm understanding the consolidation options correctly. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just, I, I wonder if anyone has looked into the transportation costs with the idea to consolidate the pre-K and the kindergarten with Romney and Doty there's, these are, you know, three, four and five year olds that are gonna be bused long distances. We already have long bus rides in those areas. My son's on the bus for 45 minutes and that's to our local school. Now we're talking about going further, like there's going to be transportation costs for that. I don't, I don't know why we're splitting um, one program at, at Romney, one program at Doty. It just, I don't feel like there is a sustainable direct direction um, and that these cuts are really bringing us closer to something. Thank you. Do Tracy. I have more time or is that, is that, that it? That's it. And But you can always bring us uh, comments just because there's still a lot to be deliberated by the board and just to be fair to everybody. Uh, go ahead, Laurela. 
um, Laura Lee Carvu, kindergarten teacher in Calais, parent of a U32 student, Berlin taxpayer. Um, I really align with what Tracy said in the way that I'm wondering um, about taking the least amount of cuts out of our budget, considering that we're going into reconfiguration options in the next few years. Um, it seems really rash to deplete the schools um, down to bare bones before that happens. And um, I also think that, um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> it concerns me that we could lose really good teachers who need full-time jobs and you might be changing their positions as well as administrators that are really um, good administrators. We need them too, and we don't want to lose them. So reducing their jobs will affect that. I um, also really want to speak to my concern that the last budget go round didn't maybe um, show good support from board members across the district. And that concerns me that all of the board members should regardless of their alignment to their feelings and whether the budget or not was the right way to go, they should be showing support for the schools and um, in unity with each other and supporting the budget. So whatever goes forward really needs to be sold to the community so that it does get voted on in a positive light. Um, and I, I also wouldn't think it would be out of the box to consider cutting high school transportation to the high school. Other local schools don't transport high school students to their school buildings. Those kids have opportunity to find uh, more resources for rides, they're older. Um, and so I'd like to see more thinking out of the box rather than just cutting line items. Thank you. Honey? I thank you um, to the leadership team for putting this together and to the board for allowing people to weigh in. Um, the proposed cuts in our 10% net spending state no service decrease. However, the ripple effect is one that we won't fully know until the fall and is really hard to understand if you're not in our school building every day and watching how the staff juggles to make things work. Um, currently, I'm collaborating with our librarian on research projects for the three grades of literacy that I teach. Our counselor and I meet a minimum of twice a week to check in about students and families and make a plan to best support kids. I'm grateful for a once a week team meeting to assess student data and make academic and social emotional learning plans. This year, we are stretched thin to have daily recess and lunch duty coverage. All of these things will be impacted and more next year. There will be less or no collaborations. There will be far less time for team meetings and planning. Making cuts to FTE of several people in our building is taking away vital pieces of the puzzle that make our schools successful. Um, lastly, I just want to also bring up to the board um, to make sure they have a full understanding of if you do not have a nurse in your school building full time, what that means for the students who need nursing care. Um, I don't have the details because I'm not a nurse, but it does fall under the nurse's license if somebody else is providing care in the building. And that's been a really big concern in the past of people not wanting um, nurses not wanting other people operating under their license and other people in the building not wanting to put that onto our nurse's license. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ali. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Allie Maney, and I have been uh, fulfilling the role of teaching librarian at two elementary schools in our district for six years. I've already written a letter about how the role of a teaching librarian is not fully understood and that using measures like EQS numbers does not represent the reality of our learning communities. I also shared that teaching librarians are on the forefront of our district's commitment to humanity and justice. And that in the age of fake news, AI, and too many digital distractions, we are promoting a love of reading and critical media literacy. 
What I did not share with you, however, are my concerns about stretching our allied arts teachers further. Spreading staff thinly across multiple schools has many unseen impacts, impacts that might be overlooked when putting together a budget. The first and most negative impact is on students who are chronically absent or vulnerable. If you teach a full slate of classes in a school for only one or two days, it is hard to develop relationships under the best conditions. Add in extreme weather days, holidays, professional development, and those students have quickly fallen through the cracks. Without these relationships and connections, we know that many students struggle to self-regulate and learn. There are also unrecognized impacts on school morale and teacher burnout. Supporting a budget that chips away at these positions when we are about to undergo a massive change in the structure of our schools seems incredibly short-sighted. I would urge you to direct school leadership to come up with a budget plan that is less severe in its impact on students and school communities next year. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ellie. Ainsley, welcome. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Ainsley. I'm a Middlesex resident, parent of two, and a teacher at Callis Elementary School. Um, these proposals are scary to me as a parent and as a teacher. I feel like a lot of what I'm seeing will sacrifice the best parts of school for many students and leave us with skeletal staff and crews that won't be able to best support student needs. The book Post cuts, in my opinion, don't feel very creative. Much of what I see here, community members have already rallied against. These cuts will create chaos during a restructuring process that already feels very turbulent. We're going to lose quality education if we settle on any of these proposed budgets, in my opinion. I've attended many board meetings, especially around this budget discussion, and I've heard your constituents ask things of you. Just in the last meeting, one of the community members from my town suggested a pamphlet as a way for the board to promote their budget and get communities and, and share communities, um, share information with communities about how their taxes will be affected and what these changes will look like within the school districts or in our schools. Respectfully, it doesn't appear that the board is taking these action steps on getting information out in creative ways to all of our towns. Our community is not united in this budget because it doesn't feel the board is united in this budget. I understand that your work is not easy and I really value the time and energy that every single board member puts into this job. But I'd ask you to think about what special place education has for you either as a parent or as a learner, and what that felt like. For me, a big part of successful education or education that I think of with a good thought is small Thank town. You. Sorry, just you have five seconds. Oriented on our children, and these cuts don't seem to support that. It's scary to me. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, my name's Alan Gilbert. I'm a former school board member. I can feel your pain. You're in a really tough position. And what I worry about um, as a former school board member, but also as a somebody in the community is you really have got to get a budget passed. If you don't, you're going to be living on 87% of what you had last year. And you do not want to do that. That is the number one thing you have got to watch out for. I think the real problem is, you know, you had a very difficult job. You, you're working within a failed system in the sense that the financial savings and the streamlined practices that consolidation was supposed to bring really haven't materialized. The structure of the Unified Union District makes finding a solution to the problems difficult. The work you've been doing as a board has become really very complex. Consolidation led to reliance on professional staff to bring to you what are hoped to be solutions to the challenges that you face. Lost have been the ongoing conversations you used to have between taxpayers and board members, local residents who support you, who need to pass budgets. We now face a really serious financial problem, not just in 2024, but continuing beyond that every year. 
I've noticed you've decided not to mail out ballots to all voters in the district's five towns for the votes uh, coming up on the budget. That's your option. And maybe you're right in thinking uh, that the people who are going to vote on April 30th are going to do that, whether they get a ballot mailed or not. But I really worry that you will undoubtedly be accused of attempting to throttle the vote by not providing ballots to everyone. And if you win the vote with a reduced voter turnout, you'll know that you've lost touch with your constituents. And though that might help for this budget, it won't be forgotten by homeowners. Homeowners will continue to grouse as their property taxes continue to rise at a rate above inflation and as schools in their towns close. What I urge you is that you put this all on hold and you have a budget of 5%, which I think could pass, and you take time to think this through clearly and thoughtfully so we really don't end up in a bad place in a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. John, can you introduce yourself? Uh, John Brabant, Town of Callis, former select board member and proponent or opponent of the consolidation. I want to say I agree with everything Alan Gilbert said, with the exception of the 5% suggestion. I, I would agree with a previous uh, uh, speaker that we should, you should please go forward with the 10% budget uh, increase. Um, I would also, it was said earlier, I think Chris McVeigh said that you folks need, that you're kind of not thinking as broadly as you should. We need to uh, have a conversation with Montpelier. Um, they're in a worse situation than we are. They were talking about a 20% increase. Um, the comments made about the full-time nurse, I totally agree with that. Please give serious reconsideration to those cuts. I had a son that was a type, type one diabetic that would have been a bad situation had he been in a school with no nurse. Um, the uh, state education fund has increasingly, like so many of these funds, become a slush fund to fund other items. I would ask, again, that you look more broadly. I know I see a uh, floor over at State House. Please uh, see if you can work with our legislative representatives to get them to narrow where those uh, state education funds are being spent to only our schools, please, please work outside of just your role here. Um, uh, what else? I, I, I got to say, as a son of a school teacher, I, I don't know why anybody want to be a school teacher in this day and age. Um, now you're dealing with these cuts across the state and across the country. This is a national phenomenon, folks. This is not unique here. And we're seeing what makes this country great howled out everywhere. Uh, please do not get radical. Um, lastly, us old folks, I'm not gonna be here in 20 years and uh, we're gonna be replaced by young folks with kids. So I'd hate to see our schools given up and then they have to build new schools because we sold them and they became an industrial park. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Miller. I am a parent of one at Berlin and two at U32 um, and also a previous Berlin uh, classroom teacher. Um, I have some concerns with the ideas around um, reducing the allied arts positions. These positions are really hard to fill in rural schools and I am concerned that they are going to get harder to fill if we have classroom teachers who are really struggling to get their work done um, to the extent they would like to get it done and they're driving all over a district. Um, I also would just really like to um, shout out, if I can, Amy Young at BES. Um, I've heard all the comments about librarians tonight, and she is that and more. She has built a makerspace in there that kids utilize during recess. That's not something she had to do. Um, I have had a number of classroom projects there that never would have happened um, if she hadn't been there to help me with the technology and also just the support. Um, so losing her um, to any extent would be a real shame. Um, I also would like to echo some other people about this idea of selling the vote. I live in West Berlin, so I'm sandwiched in between Montpelier and Payne Mountain School District. Everywhere I look, there are flyers. It's on social media. It's on Front Porch Forum about what they're asking for and why and valuing education. And people in these towns are talking about voting yes. Um, and they are bigger numbers than we're looking at. 
I feel like we have some work to do on marketing. I think you've had a lot of people show up here tonight that want to see you maintain quality programming. I'm one of them. I want to know what to share. Um, what is the board viewpoint? What can we say to get this out to our communities um, sort of in one united voice um, to really motivate people to come out and vote and support our schools with as much programming um, as we can reasonably maintain? That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, uh, Cheryl. Hi, I'm Cheryl Eklund. I am a teacher at Callis Elementary School and I teach fifth and sixth grade. And um, I agree with my colleagues, Laura Lee and Ainsley, when they were both saying that it is just unbelievable, the cuts and the slashes that they are making to Callis, especially. Like number one, cutting our art program. So we might lose Erica, who is an amazing gift to the children. The art projects that she comes up with inspires our children. My kids can't wait to get into art with her for fifth and sixth graders. There is no way that is sustainable if you're cutting that. We will lose an amazing teacher. I could go on. Losing our librarian, Nathaniel works super hard. He collaborates with every teacher and he also teaches some core subjects for our small school. We figured out how to make it work with the staff we have, and you're gonna pull from all directions and just leave us, as Ainsley said, a skeleton. I don't think that's fair, the way we're getting slashed so hard. Um, once again, coming at our principal with a 10% cut. When I told my students that, they were almost in tears. There is. I have not met many principals that work as hard and connect with every single child in our school like Kat does. We, we really need to think about these human beings and what they give to our students and not just how it looks on paper. Um, and our counselor, Ruth works, she is out straight every day, meeting with students, helping kids here, helping them there. Our kids have so many needs coming out of COVID and I know everybody wants to be over, wants to be over COVID, but it is not over. Our students are still coming back from that and we need her, her help every day. We could actually use more help in that respect and not less. Um, what else? Let me look at my list. There's just so many things here just in our own school. Oh, my kids. I talked to my fifth and sixth graders about what's going on with the state of Vermont and how we're funding schools. Thank you, Cheryl. And Sorry, we are out of time and the board really needs to meet. I apologize. You're welcome okay. to send us a letter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Meg, and I'm, I'm making for Ruben Wait, is Meg, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Flora, and thank you to the board. Um, I just want to add some comments. I did submit a letter to the board yesterday um, concerning the cuts to library services, and I'm just not sure the community understands. When we see a 0.6 cut in library services at Callis, what that means is they're going to be pulling a librarian one day a week from Berlin Elementary School, EMS, and Romney and Doty to go cover the missing position at Callis. And so it is a reduction in services when we're only looking at librarians and the outdated model of here's a block of class time um, that a librarian would teach and here's how they manage the library um, that discounts all of the other times that they're actively embedding librarian skills, um, library skills with classroom teachers, content level teachers, allied arts teachers, you've heard other teachers speak of that. So to reduce those positions, you're gonna be reducing other opportunities for librarians to collaborate with teachers, to teach digital citizenship, to teach STEM, to teach uh, literacy, um, reading and independence and enjoyment. Um, I, I just wanna say there's so much more that a librarian does and provides. We know that consolidation is gonna happen. We anticipate a three school elementary school model potentially. We know cuts are coming to the Callis library position, unfortunately for folks in Callis. Um, and we are prepared to move forward, um, but we just think a cut next year is very um, premature. Um, librarians uh, offer a great bang for the buck um, in our position in schools, and there's just so much more that we do, especially with a tech director who might be leaving the position not being filled. People are going to be leaning on us to provide those services at their schools. Administrators, teachers um, come to us for everything from tech support to which um, software should we use um, for classroom management. So the last thing I'll say is we, we do have declining enrollment, but we have increasing circulation and use of our libraries. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Meg. Uh, Ruben? Sorry, couldn't find the mute. Um, 
I'm going to start with a, just defenses of programs and individuals is honestly not helpful in this situation. Having been a school board chair for 10 years, you can make a full throated defense and position for every single position in every single school. At the end of the day, this board has work to do and it has to make a budget that's going to pass. And you have made a commitment a couple of times now. For two years, you promised to make cuts that you didn't make. And now you find yourself in an impossible corner because the completely predictable outcome of all of the forces coming to bear at once is happening. These cuts are overdue. They're not premature. I don't think a 10% budget cut uh, increase is sustainable given that we have fewer students, again, as predicted by the NESDAQ ratings for the past 10 years. None of this is a surprise. There's a sense that we, that we either raise the budget, again, for fewer students or lose quality programming. I think that's a false choice. And our administrators have said clearly that we can meet our education standards even with the 6% budget that is in front of you for consideration today. This board cannot do nothing for another year. I would also discourage you from using fund balance. That's a financial trick. I would discourage you from um, moving on. Um, I think you should consider the 6% budget with the re-addition of the building and grounds director. I think that's the budget that you should be looking at. Uh, this would have been less drastic if it was done over time. If we want to put these programs back, then we start having the conversations that finally are starting tonight about talking about where students go and what positions they have and what opportunities that we have instead of kicking the can down the road like this board has done for the last two years. This board made a promise two years ago to have these conversations and you didn't do it until the budget failed. Thanks, Ruben. Okay. The, thank you all. Thank you very much for your input. To uh, we're going to move into deliberation. is is uh, is getting really late, and the board still has a lot of work to do, uh, to give clear clarity. So we're going to go ahead, and if board members could uh, turn their cameras. Uh, yeah, I see you all. They just everybody just moved up. So I think uh, I'm I'm willing to figure out what's the best process for you guys. I think what makes the most sense is to just go around or, or popping around what your uh, reaction is. You guys had plenty of time to look at the at the documents. If you had any clarifying questions, now is the moment to ask them. Otherwise, if you, know, if you could speak to uh, one of the models in the budget that you're willing to support. Okay. Who wants to go first? Or any clarifying questions? I know a couple of you had a couple of clarifying questions. Michaela? Um, I think my internet kicked out um, when just briefly about the buildings and grounds position or yeah, can can someone just speak to that? And I'm just curious sort of why that ended up in the last case scenario and, and like what the implications of that would be. Sure, I'm gonna, I, yep, there I see you, Stephen. Do you wanna take that one? Uh, yeah, so currently U32 has a building as buildings and grounds director, and we have a district uh, director of facilities. And so what we looked at is consolidating some of that work, creating more of a lead custodian and lead uh, maintenance position at U32. Um, it's a part of the longer term. If we have fewer buildings to manage, that probably is a, a little bit of a redundant position, but it... Um, it's a difficult choice to make, but it's certainly one that uh, we feel like we can do if necessary at this time. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, though, is that the the number of uh, facilities folks in the buildings is based on square feet. And we count that buildings and grounds director in the number of people, and we are right sized currently. That is why that position's in the 6% and not as not included in the 10 or the eight, because it's really not a position that we would um, want to see go away. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, this is also a question I was wondering, um, Megan, in your presentation earlier, you said you had somewhere in your notes, uh, the per bus route cost 
And I'm also curious if you and or Stephen could respond um, to the notion of, or the, the proposed possibility of um, cutting transportation to high school. Uh, I'm gonna dig up the thing. It'll take me a few seconds. Stephen, do you mind taking the other one? I, do that. Uh, I would not recommend cutting transportation to the high school. I mean, I, I that's not a proposal that we have offered as an administration. Um, we, we feel like that is a greater issue with our students being able to get to school and be there um, on time and able to learn. Um, I, I think that would require a tremendous amount of planning uh, because we have students who don't have easy transportation to school. Um, and, and don't forget, that's... Um, are we talking high school or, or high school and middle school? It's not a it's not a subject we've explored. Thank you. I would concur that um, transportation in general is a big part of how we make sure every single kid can get to school. I did just put in the chat um, these two bus route reductions, though, we do have low ridership on some of our routes. So we do think that we could do this without actually eliminating transportation, just to be clear. Um, and it is for those two routes, it's about 165,000 based on our contract because it's roughly 82,000 per route. Um, we are also up next year to re uh, put out another request for proposals. So um, right now we have to utilize the language in our current contract and that's what that is. So that's the number in the chat. And just to follow up those, those low ridership routes, we would cut, how would they affect ride times for others? We would have our transportation folks look at the routes to, I can't speak to exactly which routes would be confined. Um, we do keep, we try to keep routes to a certain length. And so we would not make reductions that extended the bus route past, disproportionately past where we are already. Chris? You're muted. You're still muted. While well, you figure out muting, I'll, I'll let Kili go. And then you can go, Kili. Thanks. I just had a, a um, maybe a request that the estimated change in taxes table on page 11, I was wondering if we could see that as a percentage <clears throat> change. Um, just because I think that that's how people usually view those numbers. I think it's hard to say it's $340 per $100,000 house more than what you're paying already. Um, that would be great. Thanks, Kili. We can add that. It's interesting. Most people asked us for the dollar amount in general. Oh, really? why we, but we can put okay. both. Once okay. we know what we're modeling, we can put both to it. Yeah. Maybe it's just my mind that works that way then. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, I see you. You're unmuted, Chris. Go ahead. Yep. So I have a question uh, for Megan on the 10% um, category. You have uh, the the Doty uh, and Callis nurse and counselor in FY25. So does that mean not this year, but the year following this year? It means the FY25 budget, which is next year's budget. The one we're voting on? Yes. Okay, and so it's then, listed that way just because it's a reduction that we already proposed for for next year's budget. That's all. That's the only reason why it's categorized that way. The FY24 header is just simply representing that those are the reductions we proposed last year. So that's the only oh, reason okay. why those headers are there. Got okay, got it. Um, the other the other comment I have is um, there. There's nothing I think that prevents us from mixing and matching different cuts in different categories is there meaning like if we want to support uh say the um building grounds cut in the six percent category uh and keep the uh you know some of the library and and art in category the ten percent in the eight i mean we can mix and match where these different cuts are coming from right i would answer it this way the um, short answer is the board can direct 
administration. What we've tried to do is organize these around things that are directly responding to decreased enrollment. And um, I would sort of echo the comments around their reductions that we feel very strongly would allow us to continue to provide services for students. Um, typically, the role of the board is to tell us the dollar amount and what you want us to achieve. And we would then tell you where that would go. Um, so that's how I would answer that. If the board is choosing to move things around, you would need to do that very specifically um, because we've brought you the recommendations that we feel um, allow us to do it. Right, but, okay, but you've made these recommendations, these proposed cuts, but at different uh, levels of spending, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris, Michelle. Yeah, just um, something that I've noticed, and maybe somebody could speak to it because I'm sure somebody else will notice it, even as taxpayers. The largest portion, the largest percentage in our budget that is the increase is the superintendent's office. It was also the smallest decrease between the original budget and any of these um, scenarios that we have here. I don't quite understand the second part of your question, but I'll start with the first one. The line item in the superintendent's office is the is two things. The addition of the director of human resources position, which we provided a lot of information to the board back in last back last August um, around that. And the rest of the reduction is just salary and benefits reduction, which is, you know, the salary and benefits follow the teachers increases. So that is the explanation for that increase in line item is that it's an FTE that was not in the previous budget. So it shows up that way. Sorry, and you'll have to ask again the second part of your question because I just didn't understand it. So it, like when I went through all the, I'm a numbers person, I hate to say it, it's data. Um, when I went through all of the numbers, through all of the different three scenarios, every other budget went seemed to have gone down some amount. The superintendent's office went down the least. It only went down by 0.18%. So I'm just, yeah, it still just seemed a lot. Like everybody else, every other department throughout here went down a lot and the, the superintendent's office didn't. I mean, Suzanne, I don't know if you want to speak to that specific piece. Again, it's because there's a position in that line that wasn't there in the past. And even though we are then taking a position out, it's it's not going to show as much of a reduction because of that. But Suzanne, maybe you have a better. The only thing I can think is that the superintendent's uh, department has very little to change um, that's, that has much flexibility. Uh, I could dig deeper into it, but that's really, we we had the increase, you're right about the, the reason for the increase, but there's not a whole lot that you can have flexibility in with the superintendent's office. Thank, Thank you, you. Me Megan and Michelle and Suzanne. Uh, all right. Uh, Amelia, I'm a little puzzled. Is that you, Jonathan? B. Goodwin? Me. No, this is Brian. Uh, oh, yeah, Brian, we, we're we're done with community input right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you want to wait to the end of the meeting, because the board is deliberating right now, I apologize. Okay. Uh, Amelia. I'm wondering if we could have um, a comparison between slide 23 and the, the increases compared to what the increases were for the budget that was last proposed because i it seems like they're similar do you know what i mean like it seems like the the 10% and the 8% and the 6% it seems like the percentages proposed with these 
cuts is not significantly decreasing people's taxes. And I think that could be important information to pass the budget, you know, you know to, to help educate people about the, the, the weight of the CLAs, which I think is, I think, I think that the silver lining of the budget not passing is that it's really given more opportunity for people to look into those details, to get involved. Obviously, we've seen tonight a lot of feedback um, and that deeper understanding that regardless of what we choose numbers wise, the real sustainable solution is going to be in those the decision that's made in the reconfiguration. And so I think from that standpoint, my opinion is that if we can reduce the cuts as much as possible to to 10 or maybe even 5% and really continue this conversation with the community about the reconfiguration as a sustainable solution. Um, it seems like the consensus is that the, the community is better educated on the details and caught up um, in areas where they felt like there were gaps in communication. And so now there's this momentum to pass the budget and to maintain um, positions. And so I'm feeling like maybe this conversation with the board could be ongoing to April 10th and we could kind of consider potentially part of what Chris was saying, if, if we could maintain the world language program at Romney and the nurse and counseling and library and arts position with that equal to the 5% and like, how do we wanna talk about that as a board and with the community? But my, my feeling is let's continue this on April 10th okay. and not rush it. But, I'm not gonna, there's okay. some questions in there. Why, in I know, a minute, that was a lot. Let's, Let's give let's give a chance to everybody to go and then we'll go back okay. to sounds to that good. because really looking at the percentages that we have right now. Michaela. Hey Chris, I see you. I'm not ignoring you. I, know, but I, I understand. understand. Let everybody understand. go first yep. and then you can understand. again. Oh, just to be fair, this is my second question too. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah, there was nobody first? there was nobody else. So okay. it, down. Go for um, it. now you can wait. Now you can wait and Jonathan can go because he okay. hasn't asked a question. Okay, go, Jonathan. All right. Um, so just to, to think a little bit about what Chris suggested, I'm just going to put something out. I'm not putting it out necessarily as a motion right now, but um, looking at the the use of fund balance, and, and I tend to agree that, you know, we should be careful there, of course. But if you combine, let's just say for argument's sake, we use as is set, suggested on page six in our packet, that um, the, the proposal bill is assuming using no more than $923,252, right? So let's take that $923,000, combine that with the uh, 1.0 building and grounds director uh, position and pretty certain that that gets us over a million dollars in reductions already on top of the reductions that are already built into what we uh the previous budget that failed which includes right 3.0 classroom teachers a whole bunch of other teachers and and school staff which frankly two school counselors all of that makes me very very uncomfortable but then if we add another million dollars plus with what I just suggested as a new um, uh, piece of a reduction, or at least you know, take some fund balance to to supplement um, our reductions, uh, th then the impact will be uh, maybe minimal in terms of staff, rather than looking at some of these others uh, that seem to be to me again to be just really really harsh. Um, and I'll just say one other thing, which is that um, there has been a lot of um, press. There's been a lot of conversation, I think, in the state house more broadly. And I don't think we have talked about this maybe enough 
Um, and yes, it's beyond our district, but the reality is the state of Vermont needs to figure out a way how to fund public education uh, because it's a, it's turned into a disaster, I think, when over a third of the you know the districts in the state uh, their budgets failed. That's not because the individual districts are doing anything wrong. It's because over time there has been this, um, I think, building momentum, which is in a, frankly a cost shift onto local taxpayers to pay for education. And um, yes, students enrollment is declining. That's not in dispute at all. The reality, though, is for many students, the needs are actually increasing. And if needs are increasing, then it's harder than justify, say, one for one, one less student, therefore one less staff, or something like that. It just doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. So I think there's a larger, much larger conversation that needs to happen in the state about really figuring out how to fund public education that's sustainable for all the districts, for all the kids in the state, not just for individual districts. So those are my comments for now. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I just want to uh, just leave one thing on the room that, you know, we can't wait for the legislature to figure out because that is too far down. Those conversations are are happening. The, ev everybody's involved. Everybody's trying to be in the state house as much as possible. Those conversations are happening. So, but we can, as a board tonight, we can't wait for that to be resolved, right? So that is just Thank you for enforcing that. And don't worry that a lot of people are in it and we'll continue to, to lobby and you know and testify for that. But that doesn't resolve our problem tonight. No, and that's why I offered a solution that I think might work. McKaylin and then Chris. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask, I really appreciated um, it being pointed out that there you know, some of these cuts don't represent a service decrease or at least a clear service decrease. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little concerned though about, um, and I've brought this up before, um, the, the health education position at Doty is filled by, a, not a health educator, but by the nurse and the counselor. So my concern is, you know, um, getting back to cutting those positions, if that's gonna, equate to actually a service reduction for the Doty kids in terms of health education. Um, just looking at it from an, you know, an equity standpoint there. That is a question I have. And I know Gillian is like without good cell service, so I don't know if she can answer it tonight. But. I can answer it this way. Health ed is a requirement, so we have to provide it and we would have to figure out a different way of providing it. Um, in all of our school, elementary schools anyway, actually, we provide health ed in various different ways, uh, from traditional health teachers to nurses to sometimes counselors. It's all kinds of um, things. So there would be a mechanism to provide health ed, Doty. I don't have an answer to exactly what but we now, but yeah. My recollection is that each of the other elementary schools has a point two FTE designated health educator, but that Doty doesn't have that. Um, there is there are designated folks who provide health ed, and right. I understand so that, but, have... but the nurse and the counselor Doty, their FTE was not uh, designated. Anyway, right. I just I'm worried about it from an equity standpoint in terms of the cuts to the specifically right. there. And I think but, my um, answer is that yeah. it will be provided, just in a different model. I know, but I do worry about what's been said about the like pulling a little bit from everywhere in these smaller schools. Um, so, but thank you. Oh, sorry, I think I was muted and I, sorry, Zach and then Daniel, and then you can go, Chris. I didn't realize I was muted, I apologize. I think just as we started, you know, we've, we've heard a lot from people who are, you know, who are defending specific, certain specific positions. And I think that whenever you have a conversation like that, you know, people, people really rally to defend, you know, so, you know certain, you know, specific points um, with, with a couple, with a couple of notable exceptions of people talking about the need to, you know, really recognize and respond to the enrollment realities to get a budget passed. Um, I think the counterpoint to what we've heard from people is, 
fact that we also got a lot of feedback from the vote. And I think that in order to get something to pass, we we need to be looking at these scenarios that involve the bigger cuts. Um, I'm not sure that I want to go all the way to the 6% scenario, mostly because so much of that is... Um, you know, is fun, you know, is fun balance, you know, the, you know, when, when you look at the difference between the eight and the, and the six, the majority of that is an increase in fund, in fund balance transfer. And I think especially given the PCB scenario situation, I don't, I don't, you know, I want to have the reserves to deal with that. Um, I would entertain some of the other pieces there, but I think that looking at the proposed cuts, this is really about what's happened to our enrollment. I think the other thing that I do want to say, just based on the, you know, some of the things that have been said about the, the nursing, you know, I, mean, I know I talked about this earlier in the conversation, I mean, there are, there are creative things we can do with nursing. You know, I talked about telehealth earlier. I talked to one of our, through work, through one of our, our telehealth people. Um, the Winooski School District is doing full-blown primary care visits via telehealth. You know, they have, so that's, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of third services we can provide to students based on the total regional nursing capacity you know, with fewer people. Zach, what happened? You uh, were, were you done? I, I was like, I, I'm all set. Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, Daniel and then Chris. I'm a little skeptical or distracted by what you last said, Zach. I'm interested in learning more, but I, I can't visualize how that would work. Um, I do agree with Zach about the fund balance. I find that the eight and six percent um, increase options troubling from both perspectives. Troubling based on what they represent in cuts to service, and also troubling in terms of their reliance on fund balance um i'm generally against using fund balance i don't think there's a way around it this time uh, jonathan's point uh, um i think whatever whatever we contribute from fund balance this budget go around we need to acknowledge that that's going to have to be made up in the next budget right so <clears throat> the fact is if say say we're prepared to spend nine hundred thousand dollars of our fund balance uh, I think the most we should spend this year is 600 so that we have 300 to help us dig, dig ourselves out of that hole next year. And I'm not suggesting that that's what I want to do. I think something more around 300 this year and 150 next year might be a more appropriate approach. Uh, this, this is a year sort of of a perfect storm. And yes, we've kicked the can down the road. I fully acknowledge that. and. We, we need to do something this year. Also, next year will not be the same as this year. And hopefully not all the pressures will come to bear on us at once next year. That said, I still think we might have trouble, you know, if we contributed $500,000 to the operating budget from fund balance this year, that's $500,000 worth of cuts we're gonna have to face next year. And so, some sort of graduated approach, I think, makes sense. I think also it needs to be said that while I don't think a lot of voters are going to appreciate this because we can't give them hard numbers around it, you know, to Jonathan's point, there are broader conversations happening. There are other school districts in this same boat who are going to be making cuts. The property yield is going to go down. I forget which it is. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Um, and so were we to do nothing, the tax rate increase would come down a little bit. Voters need to see us also making reductions. I'm sort of landing in a 9% or a 10% range. Um, if I had to pick right now, I would pick the 10% option. Chris, it was your it was it was your turn. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, first, I want to um, just Megan, could you clarify 
uh, what central office budget means uh, since we're having this conversation about it. That's first. Second, I want to um, uh, kind of respond to Alan Gilbert in terms of the ballots not being mailed out, that we did that um, because of a timing, vote timing purpose, no other purpose, and we should state that very clearly, that there was no uh, effort to suppress the vote, which would be horrible, uh, but we did it because of our timelines, and we and we want to have another vote if we have to. Uh, and there was just it, and that's what drove the decision not to to mail the ballots out. Uh, and then the third is, um, I think we can look at these different scenarios a la carte and pick a number from each section that that we're willing to um, reduce uh, and and come up with a you know a combination of of the of the three different um, uh, proposals. Uh, each it sounds like each one. Uh, each of the proposals can, you know, be taken without diminishing the uh, offerings according to the Vermont egg quality standards. Um, but uh, but I'm leaning toward, you know, keeping as much of the um, direct services uh, for students um, as possible, um, because I think that's where you get the biggest bang for the buck, which is what I heard from the folks uh, advocating for the librarians is that there's a exponential multiplying effect from that position uh, that uh, you know spreads its um, benefit across the school in ways that other positions may not um, because they're they're the helping hands in, in a lot of different categories. So I think we should consider taking um, chunks from each of these different categories, seeing what the percentage comes up with, uh, and but with the goal toward getting, I, I do think the community is looking for a significant uh, reduction, and so I think that would have to be in the eight eight percent range myself. Um, but I think we can get there without, um, well, by minimizing harm, uh, by you know maintaining nurses, maintaining counseling, and the um, uh, the other arts positions. I think we can do that by picking and choosing from each of these different categories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I, I just want to be careful that we are not trying to undo the work that the administrators did for us, because each uh, each little sort of a la carte piece that we talk about is going to have a snowball effect on on any of the models. So we would be looking at redoing a lot of a lot of things. Diane. So. Part of what I'm going to reflect is looking at what our context is and what's going on right now, at least what's striking me. And one of the things, so director of technology, I think to me, what where it, that strikes me is that we're considering that because it's an anticipated vacancy. I realize there's also other views of how that work can be done. I just, in this day and age, and after what we went through a couple of years ago, it's it's kind of surprising to me that we would be looking at director of technology. So if one of the reasons is because of vacancy, um, and I'm not saying that that's how it's striking me, then why are we not looking broader also? We keep hearing about our reduced numbers. We know there's an increase in, in what our students need um, not just in learning, but in other things. But we also know that we've got these vacancies showing up in, in our administration of, of the high school. So what does that context look like in the reality of being able to fill those positions? And does it per allow itself for, um, for looking there? If anticipated vacancies is what also brings up opportunities, then I just wonder what does that mean for that? Uh, you know, I'm concerned that we won't be able to find people in the positions. So should is there an opportunity there for us to be considering about that structure? And so that's that's just what's striking me about that right now. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Ursula. Um, so. I think I would lean towards the 8% spending. I have some things that I'm not crazy about it. I don't like the fact that we're looking at fund balance use because it's really a one-time fix um, for a problem that will just push cuts further down the road as well. Um, pretty much not a fan of not putting money into our capital plan, but I understand the need. 
um, to look at those cuts. Having done that, I also want to speak to the fact that like using these recommendations as an a la carte menu to like pick and choose, Floor sort of said it, it undoes the work. Alicia talked to the fact that they sat down and took this really deep dive into numbers of like FTEs and students and how we serve our kids. And that's what the leadership team did. And our leadership team is made up of people in each of our schools. So they do know how they run and they know how to run schools and how they run our schools. And these are the recommendations they've made to us in these formats, not as a here are 25 line items, pick and choose what you want to get to the cut that you think would work. And I know we've talked about who came out tonight to talk and how they specifically spoke towards positions and people. And we all know, we've known for years, every time we talk about cuts, we know, we say it's hard because we know that these are people and human beings in our communities that have worked with our kids and it is sad and emotional and that is hard. But we also know that in our current configuration, there are expenses that we currently can't handle. We have had people come to previous board meetings and it is our job to remember all the people who have come to us through the entire budget process and talked. And we have had people come and very specifically talk about the affordability of living in our communities. And one of the things that I find really notable when we talk in our communities, when we ask people, what do they value? in their town or for their schools, the first thing people typically say is the community that exists. But if we price people out from being able to live here, we are pushing people out of the community. So we need to make significant cuts. We need to let the taxpayers know we're trying. And I think that we need to value the expertise of the people working in our schools who have made recommendations to us. If it's okay, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the 8% net spending increase option. I'll second that. Thank you, Zach. Okay, now we can have discussion to the motion. Uh, there's a couple of you that haven't spoken yet. So Diane, do you wanna to speak to the motion? Well, I wanna speak in general that if we have identified as our core values that we have community involvement, and community voice, then we don't really get to pick and choose what that community voice is. Tonight, there were voices I may not have agreed with, but it's up to me to hear what people are saying. So I'm just saying that we all know what brings people out in different ways, and, and that's fine. But it's if our core value is that we want community engagement, then I have to be open to what that community engagement looks like and and just be available to it it doesn't mean i have to agree or be swayed or do but i just you know we had an amazing turnout tonight and and in other nights as well and in the activities that are going on in our buildings and so it's just community engagement is community engagement and so and i guess i'm a little um i'm a little torn right now as to whether or not i'm ready to vote um, because we had said potentially waiting. So that's, I just, I'm not sure where I stand with that. Thank you, Diane. I, I think just to go off what Ursula was saying before you go, Michelle, I just want to remind people that, you know, definitely there were, there were people that lived in our communities that, uh, that were here that spoke tonight, but there are also people that work in our community and live in our community and not, that was not the majority. So towards what Ursula was saying, we got enough emails the last time and the people that, that came at our last meeting when they told us, you know, all of them that were there, just like, you know, we don't want to lose trust on you. And I'm not talking trust about administrators, so don't jump. I'm talking about trust to us, right? Like, and they told us, we are coming today to tell you, I don't need to come tomorrow because here is what I told you to do, right? All, all of the 586 people that voted no in the budget, or I can't remember now, I think it's about that, that voted no in the budget. So so I think that is what I think Ursula was trying to put in the on in the room, not, you know, like just so that we don't forget about those people that were there when we're balancing our decisions uh, tonight. Uh, 
Michelle and then and then Chris. So um, I would support the 8% increase, the 8% budget as well, um, just because there is a large number of fund balance in the 6% one. Um, one of the things though that Megan said in, when she was talking um, was about the administrative cuts that are in the 8% one and um, that like not really wanting to cut those. So my only amendment would be is could we move the U32 buildings and grounds director over and leave the principals the way they are? With everything that's going to be happening in the year, it, this coming year with the possibilities of reconfigurations, they're going to have more on their plate than um, they have in the past. So that would just be my my one thing for people to consider. So are you making a friendly amendment that then Ursula yes. and Seth have to uh, accept or you're wanting to wait? I'm just trying to clarify. Sure. I, will make a, I will make a friendly amendment that we would move the building and grounds director over and leave the principals at the FTEs that they currently are at. Okay. And then uh, I, I just want to be careful that we don't then start to move into a menu of right. things that we're moving back in. No. So, no, I'm just thinking of so the amount of work Ursula with reconfiguration. And stack to accept or not accept the 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 friendly amendment. I'm not doing this to be mean or anything, but I would not accept that. I'd not. We heard from two people who said that it's not a rec, like it's not something they'd like to do. That our buildings and grounds um, numbers are right sized, and so making that cut isn't their favorite recommendation, but it's like one of those sacrifices they would make if they had to, hence in the 6% budget. I wouldn't accept it, I'm sorry. So then we would need to vote in the motion that is on the floor right now and to move into something different. So a- uh, point, of, point of order, wait, wait, wait. Laura, I think, we, I think we can vote on her amendment, not as a friendly amendment, but as an amendment, a freestanding amendment to the initial proposal. That, that is true. We can we can do a separate amendment, not a friendly amendment. It, Michelle Megan, would Michelle would have to change her change. friendly amendment yeah. to yeah. a yeah. actual yeah. amendment. Yep. Yeah. Then go ahead. Okay. I'd like to amend the eight percent budget to have the principals stay at the current FTEs they are at and replace them with the buildings and grounds director from the 6% budget. Then you need a second for that. I will second it in the interest of democracy. Okay. So Michelle and Ursula. And How is that not treating it like a menu in a- it, it, it is treating it like a menu and we should have discussion about that. So you want discussion around the amendment is what is on the floor or we yeah, or we exactly. call the vote and we, okay. So uh, Keely. I, I was gonna comment on something else, but I, I find this hard to vote on because I don't know what the dollar amounts are for the three principles versus the grounds keeper. I don't know actually what we're doing with the budgets. Are they Are they equivalent? I think you have to vote on your potential amendment before we can enter the discussion to answer questions like that, because that uh, would be on yeah. the building is, and grounds. Isn't her question towards the amendment so that she has okay. information yes. she needs? That's Sorry. Fair. Yes. Yep. Suzanne, you want to field the uh, financial part? It is a an additional reduction to the 8% of $59,939. So explain that more, Suzanne, so it would, it's clearer. It would be further decreasing the 8% because the amount that we were cutting the principals by is $51,521. And, and the and amount that we were saving from the cut with the director of buildings and grounds is $111,000. Okay. So it's an so additional decrease on the 8% okay. of 59,939. Got it. Thank Don't you. Don't have very a percentage much. for you, but that's what right. I have for dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And wherever floor you think it makes sense, um, Stephen can just speak a little bit to why it is where it is. 
Stephen. Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that the way we put together the, the cuts for um, for U32 um, were that the the 10 percent cuts were enrollment based cuts for us. So because of the reduction in our enrollment, the 8 percent were program modifications. So things that we would have to modify that our students receive. That's why you see something like yoga in there. So while we don't get rid of our um, our PE arts programs that because yoga kind of falls into the arts actually. Um, but there are other options available to this. And then when we talk about the cuts at a 6% level, we're talking about program elimination. And so while we put this piece in there, we, we did not think that it was something that, um, it, was, it was if we needed the money at a dire level. Um, but as Suzanne said earlier, this is part of what it takes to, to clean and take care of our building. Um, but what we were trying to do is just look at what the options were. But to us, it wasn't interchangeable with other things unless we wanted to say that we were willing to cut programs and 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 some of our services at the eight percent or ten percent level. But that's just not what we were trying to do. Um, so I, I just hope you understand. We we weren't hoping that this was a menu of services, but it was really just a way for us to say that um, this is what's appropriate at each level in our decision making. And and so I just I would leave it at that point. Thank you, Stephen. Chris, do you so, have a question? Yeah, I do. So most of these cuts are cutting services. Um, across, you know, in all these different cuts are, are a reduction in service. I don't think you get away from that. Uh, and That's not, you know, what? So I Chris, apologize, yeah. Chris. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Go ahead. I'm, I, you well, know, unfortunately, well, was, we're not we're not in the same room because this is the type of dialogue which is best had, right. I think, in person because we can face each other. Uh, and and you know it's unfortunate that the storm came and we uh, you did this virtually, which I think has worked pretty well. But I, in situations like this, I think it would be helpful to be in person. But go ahead, Stephen. Um, yeah, Chris. What I would say is when you look at the the cuts at U thirty two, and and I'll have to let the elementary principals speak more specifically about theirs. When you look at the cuts that we proposed at ten percent, um, those additional teaching positions are not losses of any services or any programs for our kids. Um, what we we typically have to do a budget before our scheduling process occurs. We're in the midst of our scheduling right now, and we can see that um, that those those teachers uh, positions aren't necessary to to offer all of the courses that our students need next year. Um, and so um, so we were able to find those um, through our scheduling process um, in just the last couple of weeks, um, and and be able to say that this doesn't reduce our number of courses, it doesn't reduce our, our offerings. When you move into the 8% category, that is no longer true for us. When you move into the 8% category, we actually reduce some of our programs at that point. And at 6%, those are, those are more substantial cuts to programs and services within the school. And that, that was just for us as, um, as, a, um, as a school in the way that we were able to look at it. And, and like I said, I can't speak to how the elementary principals were able to do some of the same things. I, you know, it just, to me, it doesn't make, um, it's not clear that if you're cutting positions like 9% for the nurse, 8% for the counselor, that you're not recutting services. You, you are, and we should be blunt about that. Uh, and I think it's something that we should avoid at all costs, um, but we have to. Um, I, I agree we have to. Um, so I, I think we, an a la carte is a good way to go at this um, because by by including these, offerings in each of the different categories, uh, you've basically said that these are things we can do without. Um, not well, but do without. And so I think picking and choosing to, you know, reflect what our what our policy values are, which is, I think, more direct services for, for students like uh, nursing and counseling and taking care of them is would be a way to go and have that very uh, um, thorough and broad ranging discussion. Caroline, I'm going to let Caroline go so that maybe she can speak to the question on. I was going to speak to the amendment and just add on to what Stephen said. Um, if the, I just, I appreciate the amendment. I just don't think it's a great one to make. I think if you're going to take anything 
out of the 8%, which I really think that when we looked at it, the further we went, it, it had more of an impact. We agreed to that as a leadership team. If you felt the need to take anything out of the 8%, I do not think taking the administration out is going to land well with the other staffing FTEs that are in the eight and in the six. I, I appreciate the comments that Michelle made and I do think they are very valid. I I would not feel right if that's what if that's what was picked. Thank you, Caroline. Natasha. Um, I was just wondering if the the elementary principals could speak to an add on to what Stephen said if they had the same kind of thinking about the ten percent, eight percent, and six percent that Stephen had when looking at the looking at these. Sorry, Natasha. I did mean to speak to that when I said it. Yes, that that is. Um, with with one exception, I would say I, I do feel like um, there is a painful reduction in the 10%. And so I wouldn't say that the 10% was easy. Um, however, every percentage that we went, it had more of an impact in terms of sharing FTEs across more buildings or other things that it did go further. Um, and we did all agree with with where things went. Um, it, I hope I answered the question effectively. Sorry, it is late. Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. It, are there any other elementary principals here that want to speak to that? Chris, you have your hand up again, but oh, there's I've, a couple of people. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So let's say, let's let's vote on the let's vote on the amendment first, in and then uh, and then we'll uh, move into uh, Ursula's motion. Okay. So all those in favor of the amendment as read by Michelle, so that would uh, the total amount uh, was uh, fifty one thousand dollars and one hundred and ten. Did I get that right, is Suzanne? I think. So administrator you'd at the be, building you'd grounds. You're reducing it by yeah. 51, 521, but in, increase, sorry. <laughs> the net change is an additional decrease of $59,939. $59,999, okay. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand is going to be easier today than uh, please raise your hand if you're in favor of that. Flora, we should probably do a roll call vote if it's not unanimous since we're virtual. Okay. okay. Sorry. So old, uh, I'm going to- I just would just call- Chris, yeah. Chris, are you in favor? Uh, no, I'm voting no. Is Kate Keeley? No. Zach? No. Uh, Diane? No. Uh, Ursula? No. Uh, Amelia? No. Michelle? I'm going to say no now. Um, Michaelin and Natasha. I'm just everybody's moving. <laughs> Natasha is not. No. Okay. No. And Jonathan. And Jonathan. No. Okay. So. And Daniel's a no too. No. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Okay. Wait. I'm not totally. <laughs> okay, Daniel. No. Okay. All right. So the the motion is defeated. I hope nope. we didn't miss anybody. So now, uh, so now we can keep discussion on the motion on the eight percent, on accepting the eight percent. Uh, Chris, now I'm going to move that we table that um, uh, vote until we've had further discussion um, about and and also get further. Nobody has called the vote, so you can you can discuss, so you can keep discussing. Nobody okay. has. Called okay, the vote okay. Yet, well, so but I'm. Discussion. But I'm, but I'm the, the problem is um, what I'd also like to get 
is what the value of each of these cuts, um, proposed cuts is, because when uh, Suzanne told us about what the building grounds director's uh, amount was versus the principals, that brings it into a context where we have more information to try and achieve an 8% cut differently. Uh, and I think that would be very helpful in terms of knowing where, what each of these values are. And so I'm going to, I'm going to move that we table the vote on this uh, until we have that information and then take it up again at our um, uh, April 10th uh, meeting. That's my motion. Point of order. Yes. We have an open motion on the floor, so we can't have another motion on the floor. We can defeat this. So, so I can't. When when can, can I move to table to it? You speak to the motion. You can. You can speak to the when, motion. So once it's on the floor, you can't move to table it. I'm reviewing my. Well, you can not do that. You can postpone it. You can postpone it. I move to postpone this matter until, yeah, but we would need, um, yeah, and we would need the majority of the vote to, majority of the board to accept. Right. So you and can you do that through motion, right? Do it through a motion? Yeah, I move that we postpone this matter until. Okay, then I move that we postpone this matter until we have more information and have a further, more thorough discussion at our April 10th. Uh, meeting in person at CAUSE. So we need a second. May I second that and discuss? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I also just want to raise the point that I feel like we've heard from a lot of people that we uh, could have communicated the last budget better or more thoroughly. And so I am also hesitant to pass vote on a new budget without taking it into more community forums with these three scenarios, you know, maybe like posting more about the three scenarios, what they mean, or holding public more public forums. I just I um I think it's a really complicated process, and I think a lot of people do not understand what's going on. I think a lot of people in Berlin just saw a 25% increase in their taxes. And they're like, no. And they don't know how much of that is coming from education spending. And they don't know how much of that is coming from other things. And I think we need to do a better job of saying, this is where we're starting with no cuts. And this is where we've gotten to with cuts. But this is just something that, you know, if we don't pass this budget, we're going down to 87% at some point. Um, and maybe we adopt a budget and then we and then we socialize it better. But I yeah, am that's concerned that's... about us picking one of these numbers without more input from the community. So I, I think what, where we are right now, uh, Kelly, is that we as a board need to make a decision. The community we started this process back in September, and the vote the budget was defeated, right? So the, what we have to to do right now is if we don't adopt a budget, at least at our next meeting, we wouldn't be able to have the ability to have two votes, for example, if the vote, and, and we get mm -hmm. this much closer to being, to having to operate with an 87% budget, right? And then we would continue to, instead of like gearing up ourselves to be able to do in a more sustainable way, our configuration study and engaging the community in what the future is, is gonna be and being able to really have those conversations, we're gonna continue to delay this, this, this budget conversation. If we adopt a budget, we will be able to go out and, and, and market it. This, this year, part of what happened was that we had to hold our report because everything changed at the last meeting. We agreed in the and everything at the last meeting minute had to change. But I, I, I think as a board, we have a responsibility to adopt the budget. And I think community members had given us enough information for us to make a decision with everything that we have heard in this past few, you know, 
since the since the budget failed, right? We've heard we have got emails. We got a we had a lot of people today in this meeting. We had a lot of people at our in person meeting the last time. So so we have the responsibility. That's what they elect us to have to make those decisions, and then we have to go out and yes, sell the 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 budget. Uh, Ursula and then Natasha. So Flor, you kind of said what I was going to say, but that we are elected and it is our job to pick the budget. Um, and I understand wanting to have community input, but we have heard from a variety of people within our community through emails, through people coming to meetings, and we can't just look at this meeting. We have to look at all of the meetings that we have held. Um, I think people have been coming to meetings or we've, we've given, given them opportunities to discuss the budget since October with us. So we haven't, this isn't a rushed process at this point. And I mean, this section of it is gonna have to feel rushed because we didn't pass the first one and now we have to find a way to pass one. Um, so I think we need to pick one and then work on selling it. Thank you, Ursula and Natasha. Um, we still have time. We still meet our timelines if we don't make a decision until our next meeting. Correct. So I will only speak for myself. Um, I would appreciate waiting until next meeting to make the decision because I think that there has been new information brought forward. I think people asked questions that they're waiting for answers on. And I would like to have time to kind of process that before having to make a decision tonight, especially because we've heard so much information and seen so many slides and had so many numbers thrown at us. Um, and it's quarter of 10, um, which is not when my brain functions the best. And I do want to be very thoughtful about whatever decision it is that I make, um, because I am very conscious of the fact that we, you know, I'm representing um, not just the people in the town of Worcester, but, you know, families across the district. So I would like to hold off on making a decision on what we're, what we're going to <clears throat> forward until next week. So I have a chance to really digest what was, what was, what we heard from the community today, what was presented to us and get any additional information to the questions that were asked that we're not able to get those specific, um, answers to. Okay, so we have a motion to that, but just to ask the board a question on on what you had just discussed is like if if we if we do that, we do need to provide clarity to our leadership team, right? We're not asking them to come back with a different budget. We're asking them to to clarify the questions that were that that were that were placed. I just want to make sure that we're yes. Clear. I'm I'm not a, I'm not asking for them to come back. I. And and let me say, I appreciate the additional work that the leadership team did um, based on what they brought forward. I feel like the questions that I had at the last meeting were thought about. So I do appreciate that they were different. There was different information brought forward this time than what's been brought forward to us in the past. Um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to rework <laughs> budgets. I just want to be able to get the answers to those clarifying questions and have some time to process again, because I do want to make the most thoughtful decision about this and not make a rush decision when I am exhausted and my brain has been overrun with 47 pages of presentation slides, which I appreciate all that information, but I need to be able to digest it and <laughs> in, in a, another format besides a three hour and 44 minute meeting. Okay. Okay. So if, let's let's vote in the amendment and then uh, Amelia, Amelia do you have a question on the oh, the amendment sorry the the postpone the motion on postponing sorry I just called it an amendment it, is that I way? can ask it after that okay are people yeah. ready to vote for that I'm not trying to call the vote I'm just asking so that we can move on and provide clarity can so you we're repeat voting the motion though Please. Yeah, we're 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 uh, Chris moved to postpone. He moved to postpone this matter until the, our next meeting on the tenth in Calas. So all those in favor. So wait. So Natasha and Keely second. Hey, Floor, yes. Floor, just a quick point of order. It's not just it's not just a motion to postpone. It's a motion to table 
the the motion on the floor, which is to adopt the 8% option. Because I think it wouldn't be germane if it was just a motion to postpone. It has to be directly related to the motion on the table. Yeah, so, so it, move to postpone this matter until the next meeting. So it doesn't remove the, it just, it, we're postponing the matter. We'll come back to this question at our April 10th meeting. I'm, I'm sorry to, to quibble, but it's not just postponing the matter. It's sp speaking specifically to Ursula's proposed motion. And he's, he, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, because otherwise it's not germane. You need to be proposing to table that specific motion. Yes. yes. So that matter that what he said. So we are just not calling it motion is postponing Ursula's motion until our next meeting. Ursula. Um, so I'm just looking at Robert Robert's rules right now, and we can either pass, defeat, table, refer to committee, or postpone indefinitely. So I want to make sure we're using the right word. And so it would be the table until the next meeting. The current motion. Which is fine. I'll use the word table. I just want to make sure it's not, that it's not meant to postpone indefinitely because we have to. Right. Right. Yeah. And I was not postponing it indefinitely. I was just postponing until the next meeting. So either either way. So okay. I want to thank our fellow par parliamentarians. Well, I, <laughs> I'm trying to use the <laughs> table that we put together. So, OK. Uh, Natasha is a yes. Uh, I'm not even going to look at the screen. Daniel. No. You don't want to postpone it? <laughs> you want to make a decision today? Okay. All right. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, yes to postpone it. Terrible. Chris. Yes. Uh, Zach. No. Uh, Keely. Sorry, I hesitated and then I was muted. Yes. Okay. Diane. Yes. Ursula. Yes. Amelia. Yes. Michelle. No. Good. I am missing. One of you guys. Galen says yes. yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, please. Yes. That one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight yeses, and one, two, three noes. So the motion carries. So it's we'll discuss at our next meeting. Now we need some clarity. Can I revoice what yeah. I think the follow up yeah. question is and then yes. make sure I have it right so we bring you what you need? One is a dollar amounts for the reductions proposed on the chart. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um that's all I definitively have. So if you could define <laughs> define what else you need us to bring. That's the only clarity I can bring to it right now. Yeah. Kelly and then Amelia. I see. Oh, with up. Amelia first. I I am oh. saying okay. something. Else. I'll put my hand down for a minute. Okay. I am wondering if we would, if we could see the ten percent net ed spending without the art and library cuts, as a response to what a lot of community members were concerned about. If we go with the ten percent, and maybe it go, maybe it bumps it up to eleven or twelve. I think. But I'm wondering if we could see, if we could explore that as a board. I think the way to get at that would be you, if the board is choosing to make decisions about moving things around, you would do that based on the items with the dollar amounts that we're going to bring to you. Yeah. Otherwise, we're re-proposing, and we already have proposed. So I think if you're going to do that, you would have a motion on the table at the time. What you don't have right now is the dollar amounts to inform okay. you. So I think yeah. you'll be able to get there. OK. Thank you. Otherwise, I think each, per, each one of you may have a different version of that, and it would be better just for 
you to have the information and have your discussion on the 10th. Thank you. Okay, Daniel. I was just going to say one other clarification that would be helpful. We heard from Stephen, we heard from Caroline, but it just the a little bit about you know what administration's philosophy was in creating the 10% proposal, what their philosophy was in creating the 8% proposal, and what their philosophy was in creating the 6% proposal. So maybe that's just re-articulating what Stephen and Caroline said and what you also I think said spoke to a bit, Megan, but just for clarity's sake, if that could be written, I would appreciate that. Okay. All right. So there's no other clear. Uh, Kelly. All right. This isn't a clarification. Does anybody else have clarifications? I just wanted to ask something. So if, if nobody else has clarifications, I just want to completely clarify. So Megan and her team are coming back to us just with those questions answered. Correct. All right. They're not redoing anything. Okay. All right. Keely. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if before we before we moved on though, if we could go around and just say how people are leaning or feeling. Cause I know we had the eight percent motion and I I don't know if that's what most people are feeling or or just some people, but I think it would be good to get a sense of where we are as a board going into that next week's vote. Would people be amenable to that? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I think it's a good question. I, that was my original question. Which of the budgets were you most, you know, to speak to that? And I don't think anybody spoke to anyone specific, but if people we could uh, just say thumbs up if you're leaning towards eight percent or thumbs up if you're so we can do let's start with ten percent, just thumbs up. Not there's no vote or you know, like you feel like that is the budget that you would be willing to to support. 10%. So we have one, just to get one, let me see, one, two, three, four. Okay. 8%. There was more than four for 10% floor. Oh, oh, okay. I, so what I, I believe it I was. I counted six. six. Okay. Thank you. So if you were 6%, if you were 10%, could you just raise your hand again? I just want to get a better count of. So it's Natasha, Chris, and Emilia, Diane, and Jonathan, right? And Kaylin, uh, you're all the way down in my screen. I don't know why. And Daniel. And Daniel. Okay. Now... Ten eight percent. One, two, three, four. Is that am I counting that right? One, two, three, four. Uh, Suzanne. I was just saying I counted five, so I'm not sure I'm <laughs> yeah, getting yeah, right. Yeah, it's just late. I feel. So what if so we went through everybody and just asked them which one? Would that be a better way to get sure. through the counts, essentially? Sure, and then we and then we we'll adjourn because it's so late for everybody. Keely, just pick one. Well, honestly, I'm torn between ten and eight, and I really want to see that percentage tax rate increase because I think that's how the voters are gonna look at it. Okay, between ten and I, eight. I prefer ten, but I gotta see what it looks like. Uh, Michelle. Eight. Zach. Eight. Diane. Ten. Natasha. Ten. Jonathan. Ten. Uh, Daniel. I think ten. Uh, Amelia. 
and preferably without the elementary allied arts cuts. Yeah. Chris? Um, and I would say between eight and 10, uh, but with a different configuration. Um, and I think we can get there by you know, serve community's purposes and, and hopefully uh, general board purposes. But so between eight and 10. Ursula? Eight. And McKaylin? Um. You frozen? Oh, I said 10. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, we couldn't hear you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, okay. I, didn't unmute. I, I, I was like, just waiting and waiting at <laughs> the suspense. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that concludes the meeting for today. Could I have a motion to adjourn by consensus? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, thanks everyone. to the public for Good showing night. up.